Good evening and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin work session and special meeting for July 17, 2018. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, we are going to start with our work session this evening, and then we have a few items for our special meeting. First up, we invite Lori Ensinger from Westchester Land Trust to discuss with the board an exciting project that uh, the Land Trust has shepherded in the town of Cortland, um, which is a budding ostening and which would preserve open space, one of your goals, your main goal, I think. And uh, Lori, thanks so much for joining us tonight, and please discuss with the board a little bit about the project. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you to everyone on the board. My name is Lori Ensinger. I'm the president of Westchester Land Trust. Uh, we are the regional land trust for Westchester County, and our mission is to work with public and private landowners to preserve land in perpetuity, to protect the natural resources of our region. We are here today to discuss with you a property that we are seeking to acquire with primary funding coming from the New York State Water Quality Improvement Program pool that is through the CFA funding application that you're all very familiar with, I'm sure. The deadline for this particular grant, as you also know, is next week. Uh, and we are lining up the required letters of support and hopefully some potential funding partners uh, to make this grant as compelling as possible. So as I said, this funding is coming out of New York State DEC. It is specifically and only for land acquisition for drinking source water protection. So it has to be drinking water. The property that we're talking about is in Cortland, and you should have a package of maps with you. There are five maps. Uh, page numbers are hard to see in the lower right-hand corner of each page in red, but I'll walk you through these pretty quickly from 60,000 feet on down to closer. Uh, the property is at 122 T-Town Road in Cortland. You can see on that first page the red parcel is right on the right on the municipal boundary between Cortland and Newcastle and about 1,500 yards away from the Indian Brook Reservoir, which is physically located in the town of Austin. On the next map, you'll see a close-up uh, aerial photograph of the property. It is 25 and a half acres. You'll see pretty clearly on this photograph the pond, which is a man-made pond created about 60 years ago by uh, the then owner who dammed the Indian Brook, which flows north-south through the property on its way to the actual Indian Brook Reservoir, again, about 1,500 yards away from this particular property. This parcel has never been developed. You can see it's fully wooded right down to the shoreline of the pond and the stream. It has no structures on it. Hmm. On page three, you'll see one of the reasons why this property is so attractive to us it's a missing puzzle piece, if you will, in a vast, over 1,000 acre, contiguous protected forest block stretching from Ossining into Newcastle, into Cortland, and actually on over to Yorktown. And you'll see the legend on this particular map. Again, the parcel is in red. Notice T-Town that you're all familiar with, 1,000 acre private nature preserve. All the municipal parkland, including Sunny Ridge Park in Newcastle, the Briarcliff Peekskill Trailway, which stretches north-south in green, uh, the Croton Gorge Dam Park up right at the outflow of the New Croton Reservoir. Um, so this is a, really a tremendous opportunity for us to preserve another contiguous piece in this collective. I'm going to bring your attention quickly to that light blue parcel just south of the red subject parcel. That is Ossining Water Company lands. It is not an Ossining. It is in Newcastle. So this is a good example of how our drinking water doesn't recognize municipal boundaries. And wherever we protect land, it shouldn't matter what municipality it's in. We're all in this together. So this particular parcel is in Cortland. Ossining Water Company has already set precedent by buying land in Newcastle, in addition to owning the lands around the Indian Brook Reservoir itself. 
The hydrological map is on the next page, and here you'll see the linkage where our water flows. And it's well-known science that if you pollute the water upstream from a reservoir, those pollutants very quickly find their way into the drinking water supply. So the Indian Brook, you can see flowing through the red subject parcel south and then southwest right into the Indian Brook Reservoir. Again, about 1,500 yards away, and it stretches over two, uh, really, th we're talking about three municipalities involved in this. And you can see the interrelatedness of all the ponds and streams. This is not Croton Reservoir. Uh, it is not Croton Watershed. It is Indian Brook Watershed, which is different. So this is not under the purview of New York City DEP, by the way. And then finally, on the, on the map on page five, to uh, preempt a possible question about potential public access for this parcel, we do intend to allow public access. As a matter of fact, we're working closely with our dear friend and partner, T-Town, to help fundraise for the required match for this grant. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we asked T-Town if they could conceive of this parcel having an important role to play in their existing trail network. And their trail stewards worked up this concept plan, which is the white dotted line. And this will create what I believe Kevin Carter said to me would be the largest or the longest or one of the longest continuous loop trails in their system. It would be five miles long, which would be a tremendous opportunity for passive recreation, stretching from T-Town through this parcel, down through um, Sunny Ridge Park in Newcastle, and then back up through the Briarcliff Peak School Trailway, and back on home to T-Town. So not only does it potentially serve a purpose for protecting watershed and drinking, specifically drinking water supply for Austin Town and Austin Village, but it also affords very interesting passive recreational opportunities for the public. New York State does not want public access on the parcels that they're acquiring through this grant unless we can fully justify it. And I think what we all know is the tremendous economic benefit that T-Town brings to the broader community um, through 30 to 35,000 visitors a year that bring monies into the surrounding towns um, because of the presence of this trail system, the camp, the programming, Eagle Fest, et cetera, all of which I'm sure you're very familiar with. So we think that it's highly justifiable to allow a trail to go through this property as long as we don't allow any activities in the stream or the pond itself. So no fishing, no paddling, no skating. It's a small pond. It's about an acre to two acres in size. So it's not as if there's you know, tremendous boating activities possible on this in any event. So that's the, the quick summary of the property itself. Uh, why are we here today? We are hoping for a strong letter of support from the town. We're seeking one from the village as well, as well as from the town of Cortland. We had a meeting last week with the town of Cortland. Um, you have a draft template of a letter of support in front of you. Um, we are also hoping that you might consider some very modest financial support towards the match. We have to raise $160,000 of cash match to be successful with this acquisition. We have some pretty strong verbal commitments from private donors, individual donors, a private foundation, um, and T-Town's operating budget and Westchester Land Trust's operating budget. So we are putting significant cash match into the project, as is T-Town. We're hopeful, again, I know it's difficult, but we're hopeful it would make the application even stronger if the town could contribute or could say in the letter, we are currently contemplating or deliberating over a modest amount of cash support that could go towards the cash match. Uh, we don't have to have a number at this particular time for the grant, but if that's amenable to you, that I think would um, raise the attractiveness of the application in the state's eyes. We could not, and I'll turn my comments to the town attorney for one quick second, we could not offer a legal property interest in exchange. Um, the state requires that the applicant to the grant be the owner, the fee owner of the property. Um, and given that there are two other municipalities, I don't know how we could have four co-owners of the property and make this work. So that might be a sticking point. Even if you were to put in modest contribution to the acquisition, 
if you'd require a legal property interest back, we'd have to talk about that. What, um, <clears throat> at, since it is in Cortland, how did Cortland, uh, how is Cortland reacting to this? They are taking the week to deliberate on it. Okay. So we don't have an answer. Okay. Know. And is that, is that to the letter or to the financial match? Both. To both. both. Okay. Okay. And is that because, I mean, obviously it's coming off the tax rolls for them. Yes. Right. So that would be why. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to get inside their head. Right. But they've, I mean, they, as you know, are very open space friendly. Right. That's, and that's, that's the only this thing. This particular I can... property was specifically named in Cortland's open space plan. Right. Ranked as very highest priority for protection because of watershed protection for Ossining. Right. So it's a great example of how, you know, intermunicipal agreement. I didn't mention what is clearly, um, paramount in the letter of support, which is the Indian Brook Reservoir and Croton Gorge, uh, Croton Reservoir Intermunicipal Agreement, um, which was struck in 2007, uh, to which Austin Town, Austin Village, Cortland, Village of Croton on Hudson, Town Newcastle, and the county were all signatories. The acquisition of this parcel would be a great example of action item coming out of a planning process that the state DEC, by the way, funded back in 2007. So, and we're still working with that same, um, you know, intermunicipal group on pr continued protections as were articulated in that plan um, and f to look for additional ways. I mean, one of the things that we have um, discussed in, you know, in our, in our stakeholder meetings um, have to do with, you know, an overlay zone and, and finding other additional ways to protect the watershed. So, I mean, this obviously is d directly ties into that. I think, you know, our, my only hesitation would be, I just want to reach out to Cortland and see if those, um, you know, I think I, I feel like it would be a little odd for us to say, yeah, yeah, go. And then have the municipality where it actually directly impacts their bottom line, essentially, um, saying, no, 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 we don't want this. So that's, that's, that's why I'm asking that particular sure. question. Sure. So the state requires the municipality in which the property is located to actually sign off on it okay. af after approval of the grant, which is interesting. Okay. Uh, which, but we wanted to meet with Linda prior, obviously, right. to find out. And she's 100% in favor of this. Oh, great. Okay. So well, she, that's good. she just needs to go through the same process officially presented to her board. But um, okay. because it was named in their open space plan right. specifically. Uh, oh, good. Okay. So that's, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's done. We just don't have a, a dollar yes. figure and it may be zero. Right. It depends on, on where their fiscal situation is. Right. So. I mean, the idea of supporting something that ultimately is going to benefit T-Town, which benefits all of us, you know, has, um, some, something interesting about it, but I, I just don't know if that's a gift of public funds. Like, I don't know what the legal, um, you know, ramifications would be how we, how we do that. So I, I think we just need to know. I'm just wondering if we couldn't put it into some of our park budget because it would be a nice continuous park that does come through some of the Austin area with that big loop, and that could even go with our MoGo. Well, it's um, it's yeah, we have our a whole you know, desire to desire create to create that large uh, open, walkable, bikeable spaces. So I really think that you know we have some funding on that side, and some. So I'd like to. Say, I'm a huge favor of you know preserving our watershed, um, as probably everybody knows. Um, and the T-Town area is dear to my heart as I grew up in those woods. Uh, so I like it. Is that the pond across from Cliffdale Farm? Okay, so I've always loved that pond too. So, yeah, and I didn't, and it does drain into our own drinking water, which, you know, we, at all costs, I think, should preserve every bit we could and protect it in any way we could. So I'm all for signing this, just even if Cortland doesn't like it. Dana, the update, which I'd given to Maddie this morning, um, but just for the public record, the new news over the weekend, we did reach an agreement with the landowner. Oh, good. Price. Oh, okay. So it makes the application that much stronger because the state would like to fund what they call shovel-ready. Bad sure. analogy here, but yeah. shovel-ready projects where you have a, a seller, a willing seller, and a price. Uh, we just need to confirm that with an appraisal, and that's going to that process will start in the next month or so. And that piece really does open up a nice pathway, continuous. And there are some other landowners that would probably jump in there if that piece were to belong to a green greenway 
um, I think there are other landowners that would kind of give in also. So I think it's ever-growing protection of our watershed out there, which I love. Yeah, I, I like the action. What size of lake that is? Uh, we're estimating one to two acres. It's quite small. I'm bored if I can go fishing, and if I can't. <laughs> You're going to make her joke. <laughs> Well, you can walk over to Cedar Lane and go fishing. Yeah. I don't want to fish Cedar Lane. I want to, this lake is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and probably. But you just said that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be allowed yeah, to that? have fishing. Okay. DEC says no to fishing. Now, why is that? Because they, they feel like they they're not protecting it? They don't explicitly say no in no, the guidelines. But they say if you allow right. any public activity, you have to justify it and have very good reason to justify it. Um, I think passive recreation, i.e. a hiking trail, is about as far as we can push this, especially given that T-Town Lake and Cliffdale Lake and Vernay Lake and Shadow Lake are all in the vicinity in the T-Town complex. I'm not sure that it's necessary for us to, to you know, hold this out as a fishing opportunity. There's also no place to park, as you know. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty gnarly section of, of T-Town Road. Um, there will not be a trailhead on this property, and there will not be any access to the trail system from this property. The access will be elsewhere in, in the T-Town system and uh, probably on the Briarcliff Peekskill Trailway. I don't really see, I think you you brought up the issue of gifting municipal funds. I don't really see that as being an issue here. There are clear benefits to the town that have been delineated by, um, by doing this. And, you know, the town does frequently get grants that require some sort of matching component to it. So, um, I mean, we can look into it a little bit further, but if the town board did want to consider making some sort of financial contribution, um, it, it would, I don't see it as being an issue. Do we have a budget director? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that it will help bolster uh, future grant applications for us as well for any of the open space and uh, bike trail uh, connectivity uh, grants that we've been looking into, so that that would um, seem like it would go a long way. Fantastic. So, except for the fishing, <laughs> without further, <laughs> are there any additional questions? I think that you know, I think we're, that we're um, we have consensus that we would write this letter, and I don't think we need any sort of a resolution to do that. Um, to do a letter of support, we never usually do re resolutions for letter of support. I just wanted to bring it to. Oh, but maybe we said we were going to do that for. I mean, but the know, problem is that we have to throw it on right now because the grant is due. Oh no, next week. Oh, we could do. We could. We could do it. Do the Tuesday night is our next meeting. So would that be okay in terms of okay? All right, so we could throw it on our meeting for Tuesday, um, presuming there's no issue, and then. Potentially so we do need a resolution something. if we're contemplating money. Is that the issue? We would well. So I think what Lori was saying is that we could say if we if we wanted to contemplate money, we could say that we were interested in um, some uh, what did you say some modest cash ma match or cash Financial contribution, contribution. Not match. Or the, and yes that we can add to the letter and right. I had reviewed the letter and generally I don't have any issues with it. There is some language that. I would like to see tweaked, but we can talk about that and okay. talk to Lori um, right. and get that fleshed out okay. prior to next week. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate your support. Okay. And next up, we have our receiver of taxes, Honorable Holly Perlowitz, who's here tonight to discuss the town's moving to a lockbox collection system to help reduce the overall expense of tax collection. Madam Receiver, would you like to join us and explain what you have been working on and just give us a little overview of this memo that you have drafted? Uh, a, a short overview is um, I'm here tonight to ask for approval to sign an agreement with Sterling National Bank for lockbox services. Um, as you would assume or I'll let you know that there are lots of highs and lows in volume as we go through collection cycles. And uh, during these collection cycles, 
uh, even during the, the high times, there are really, really intense times of the last two weeks of every collection. So that would be at the end of September, um, at the end of January, and at the end of April. And um, I, at some t time, we get through those times using uh, temporary help or um, paying overtime. And I sought the advice or guidance of other tax receivers in Westchester who face the same intensity of collection time during collection times as I do and asked them, you know, do they use, how do they handle that? Do they ever use lockbox services? And of course, you know, there's a, um, there's a mixed review. Some do, a lot do, and some don't. Um, I also sought the advice of um, our own village, which uses lockbox uh, services as well. And I do have a, a strong banking background, so I have some experience in lockboxes as well. And um, I think I've come up with a plan that I'm comfortable with to start rolling into this. And um, I think what will happen is that we will be able to, I will anticipate, or my expectation is we will then get through these collection times without overtime, paying overtime, and without utilizing temporary help, and um, that will save money. Um, so my initial plan uh, is to actually add a barcode to our, our vouchers. Um, I, all of us live here in, in Ossining, so you know when you get your bills, you have um, these vouchers, and there will be a barcode that's added, which is a simple process. It's part of our current system, and we can add that very easily. Um, and uh, then, you know, the, the way I'm, ro I'm proposing rolling this out is that the lockbox will only process a payment that exactly matches what the barcode says exactly. So if there's any difference, and we do have differences, we have people who might send us 10 cents more or 10 cents less or a dollar more or a dollar less, or people who, um, you know, there's various variations. So I have established that they will only accept something that matches exactly. I'm also, again, in, in a way of controlling this and starting it slowly, we're not setting up a separate post office box, which is traditional with lock boxes. We're not going to do that. The payments will still come right here to this office, and um, we will be the ones who will feed the lock box. So essentially, I'm replacing a data entry person for no cost. And there, there's no out out of pocket cost to us because the balances that we maintain during those times of high collection. Is, is like an earnings credit, and the bank is not charging us for either the initial setup or for the services that they'll provide during that time. And so, again, I'm doing it very, in a very controlled way. So everything else will still stay the same. People can still walk into our offices and pay their, their, tax, their taxes that way. People can still pay in cash. Uh, people can still pay online. Um, now, obviously, we, we will process all of those along with the uh, tax payments that we get from about 40% of our homeowners have a mortgage on their property, and we get paid by their mortgage holder as well because they escrow for taxes. So again, I, I, am, I am asking if I can sign this agreement, uh, roll this out in a very, very controlled manner. Um, and uh, reevaluate it after the September collection. And uh, there is a 30 day cancellation policy from either side. So um, if we decide that it's not something that's working for us or we're not getting the benefit that we expected, it will be no out of pocket cost to try it. And um, we'll, I'll reevaluate it after, after uh, the September collection. But, you know, again, my, my goal was to um, save money and for the department and uh, to take advantage of technology. Great. So.
So does the board have any questions? Um, I had two actually. Uh, the first question was um, the municipalities that you spoke to, how long have they been using this service? For a very long time. Okay. Um, I, uh, now they use it with, another, with other banks, uh, but our village here has been using it for quite some time. I, I'm going to say at least six or seven years that I, that I know of. Um, and um, I spoke to people in Bedford. They've been using it for a very long time as well. So, I mean, lockbox services have been around um, for a long time. So they have been using it, and there's, there's a pattern of um, one person said to me they don't know how they'd live without it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And you said you had a second yeah, question. Yeah, uh, the second question was the people that you spoke to that didn't like Lockbox or weren't using it, are they using another service or are they just not using anything? They're not. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, it, it depends on how comfortable one is with um, technology and the advances in technology and in control. I mean, I, I in my experience, you know, I'm also very much uh, concerned. I'm an accountant by, by profession. I like control. Some people who work with me here might realize that as well. Um, but you can still have control of technology. The thing is, is that you can't let it get beyond a day of balancing. You have to always make sure you stay on top of things. And that's the way I run the office now. Uh, at the end of every day, we balance. And that's how if any problem is going to unearth itself, it's going to unearth itself where I can deal with it within, you know, 24 hours of transactions, so. Well, I was going to ask you. Oh, hold on one second. You need that? Okay, thank you. I was just going to ask you, is, is this going to make things uh, simpler for you in the office or easier? I, I think so. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I think is very important is for our taxpayers to get our undivided attention when they come in the door and have a question or a concern. And if you, uh, you know, have in the back of your mind that you have all this data entry work to do, um, you know, it takes, it takes you away. Plus, I do think that the process of data entry work you're working on something and then someone walks in the door and you literally need to stop what you're doing, according to my instructions. <laughs> so a taxpayer comes in, they get our undivided attention. You have to stop what you're doing, help the taxpayer, and then come back and reorient yourself as to where you are in the, in the process. So in the process of entering data. So I think it will make things easier. You know, it's focus. You know, someone, someone who is constantly you know, all they're doing is data entry. Their, their focus is that versus I'm doing data entry and I'm also helping taxpayers. Well, if it's good for you and your office, uh, I don't see why they don't want <laughs> No, but I, I was just kidding when I said that. But uh, if it's good for you and your office, I, I, I have no reason, no problem with it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm all for it. I've heard uh, the village talking about it. I've heard Dale talking about it, and they seem in favor. So if you want to try it and you're comfortable with how it all works, then go for it and let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. I think you got your answer. Uh, There's a resolution on the special meeting this evening yes. to authorize Holly to sign that contract. Okay. So you'll have the opportunity to memorialize that decision yeah, shortly. So. All right. All right. Before we move okay, on. Okay, sorry. So, Holly, had, you provided a draft of this contract. Is that I received something with our materials. Is there? It seems like it's kind of marked up and stuff. Is there going to be a specific contract that's personalized to the services that will be provided by the to the town? Yes, I actually have a copy of it here, so I can forward it to you. Th this one that you had is marked up with my comments. Right, and, and so they've I've agreed to all of them. So changes have been made based yes. upon what, what you put in here, based on 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 what I. Put in plus Does our they, resolution say as to form because then we could make sure that this so other town board hereby authorize the receiver to enter into contract with Sterling National Bank, uh, appro with approved by t council to the town as to form, um, to be approved. Okay. Can I, just because I haven't really had an opportunity to discuss okay. this with Cat with Holly, excuse me. 
so I, I would feel more comfortable if there wasn't, you know, if, if there was still some room to kind of go through things and work some things out. Um, one thing just to bring to your attention is that there is a waiver of liability clause in, in the version that I've seen that pretty much says, you know, as long as the bank is in grossly negligent or willfully misconduct, they're not responsible for any um, errors that occur as a result of this. No, so, and we did get into something not long ago about timing issue, right? Do you remember what I'm, I'm talking about? Where there was some, t this was, la you know, early That on. had to do with an online payment. Right. It had nothing to do with. No, I know, but I mean, is there, it, is, could you have the same kind of thing happen even with this where something wasn't either recorded or it wasn't, it was somebody thought they had made their payment and it had cleared and it hadn't and then they, the, the bank didn't accept responsibility, maybe should have? Is that a possible? Thing? It wasn't the bank. It was Express Pay, which is our. Um... No, I know. I, I know it wasn't the bank. Okay. But I'm just saying, could something like that happen in this with a lockbox setup where you could have something similar happen with Sterling, and then they would not take responsibility, or they're. they're kind I of can't saying, anticipate. I I can't. I can't think of an instance where something like that would get. Could happen. I guess this, we could consult with we could consult with Phil Drossinger maybe. A couple sure, of to sure. See if that's something that. Sure, absolutely, and I do have um, I do have the agreement that they marked up with my comments, and I'm sure they're open to anything else. But I don't. Um, I think it's a fairly standard agreement, and I'm sure it um, is. I don't. Um, I don't know that we would get them to. Um, I don't think we would. It's, it's just before you right. know the town go, the town board goes forward with approving this. It's something that sure. comes up in a lot of different contracts yeah. that we work on, and it's nobody wants liability. I make a point right. of, nobody of wants bringing to their attention so that you know you know the full scope. Of, um, if something were to happen um, with this setup, it, uh, you know, the, ultimately the buck stops with the town. Mm -hmm. Even if the town isn't, even if the receiver's office isn't the one accepting that payment. Okay. Well, we are accepting all the payments because all the payments are going to come here. There is not going to be the separate lockbox that doesn't pass through our office. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things that, and that's actually the way the village has it set up as well. In other words, the payments will still come to our office. We will package them up, make sure that they're only getting the ones without any exceptions and send them to um, the servicer within a 24-hour period, and they will enter them. Okay, so it's... So you're going to check So there's in. oversight that, first on our So end. you're going to know that the taxpayer handed that money in and count them as before it goes off to the bank. I, I'm to the going box. to know that, that a payment came in. I'm not going to log amount. them in because yeah, that would know. be... No, you're not going to log them in. I'm not going to log them in, but I'm going to know that the check amount matches the voucher amount. Okay. I'm going to know that exactly. So that's that's the way I'm controlling it at the onset, and I until I'm comfortable that this is a working this is working well, okay, and then I'm going to be electronically getting a report the next morning that tells me every payment that they entered and um, any payment that they had an issue with, and if I don't feel that I can respond to the one that they had an issue with without visually seeing going on they will send it back to me okay sounds good sounds really thank good. you okay so next up I would like to give you an update on the work of MOGO or Millwood Austin go task force I will be joined from the sidelines by our acting town clerk and grant writer extraordinaire Victoria Caffarelli who put this lovely presentation together in your packets, we shared a copy of the draft Millwood Austin Go plan, um, which was crafted by Westchester County planner, Tracy Corbett. This plan, and I just want to grab the plan actually so I can tell you, um, it was the uh, result of the task force that came together to work with a grant that we received from the Hudson Valley Greenway with the town of Austin as lead agency to establish bike and pedestrian yeah, connectivity you. between downtown Austin and the North County Trailway in Millwood in Newcastle. 
We partnered with the Village of Ossining and the Town of Newcastle to find ways to create linkages to open spaces. Tom, can you hear me? Because I'm a little away from the mic. Okay. To uh, create linkages to open spaces, bike and trailway, uh, bike lanes and trailways, and business districts that would serve cyclists of many levels as well as pedestrians. The New York State DOT also worked with us and developed a plan specifically for the Route 133 corridor that would connect from Route 9 to Route 100. And they did a study um, basically on their dime uh, to take a look at exactly what it would look like to concoct a plan for 133 so that cyclists could go all the way from point A to point B or back. We're hoping the town board will take a look at the plan if you haven't had a chance to thoroughly look through it already, which we you know we gave it to you on the late side. Um, it was just recently, I'm not going to say finalized, but this, this draft was finalized recently uh, by county um, planner Tracy Corbett, um, who's actually leaving the county to come and work for the village of Ossining. So we're still going to have her um, involved, we, ho we hope. Um, we'll have her continue involvement, but we're very um, thankful for, to her for all her work on this project. And we're giving it to the town board, and we hope that you will share any suggestions with us to improve it, and then hopefully bless it so that we can use it as a jumping off point to get grant money to start to implement some of the recommendations. And again, th these are grants that we're probably going to have to seek with all three municipalities and possibly we have also had involvement from the village of Briarcliff and the town of Yorktown and Yorktown Trail Town, which is their um, environmental, not envi advisory committee, but an environmental committee, maybe similar to Green Austin with a focus on hiking and biking and um, outdoor recreation. Um, I just wanted to uh, let, let you know who was on the committee, uh, myself, uh, Victoria Caffarelli, Missy Elks from the, our Environmental Advisory Committee, Mark Wilson, uh, who's a trustee uh, in the village of Briarcliff, Sabrina Char Charney Hall, who's the Director of Planning in the Town of Newcastle, Steve Coleman is the Environmental Coordinator for the Town of Newcastle, Tracy Corbett, as I mentioned, Principal Planner for Westchester County Department of Planning, Ilana Wagner is still a planner from Westchester County Department of Public Works and Transportation. Um, Emily Laughlin, Communications Director for Office of Assemblywoman Sandy Galef. San Sandra Jobson, Regional Planning and Program Manager for New York State Department of Transportation. Kate Marshall, who's an Austin resident and also a member of Westchester Cycle Club. And Laura Kelly, who's a Yorktown resident and also with Yorktown Trail Town and Westchester Cycle Club. I think there's one other and the, New York Bicycle and the New York Bicycle Coalition. Right. So um, just briefly, um, the goal of this, as I mentioned, is to support connectivity through and between Austin Village, Town, and Newcastle, and specifically our recreation areas, our trails, our parks, historic places, tourist and business destinations, and find a way to make those connections um, in a way that um, really works with people uh, who are on bicycles and on foot, and maybe even on scooters or other s types of things that people are interested in using. It could even be, do they still have rollerblades? What are those called? Things called? Yeah, those two. Um, so, plan seeks to improve connectivity between parks, commercial areas, public transportation, and residential areas in our communities. The area that you can see on this map is a little difficult to see, but um, there's different colors, um, and the legend, which is also a little hard to read, um, basically uh, takes a look at how we... Um, Ha the different levels of recreation little use that would that would uh, form this path. So we may have um, areas that are you know steeper slopes and um, more narrow streets. We may have areas that are um, are more trafficked, and then we have areas of commercial that commercial 
um, or business districts that might be a destination because you want to stop there to get a frozen yogurt or a cup of coffee or a, you know, a sandwich along the way. So what we've done is, as you can see, it kind of, um, all of these colored lines include some of the different um, areas that we're trying to connect. So the thick pink one would be the bar. The, I'm um, sorry. Actually, this map just shows some of the main roads. This oh, okay. Is the map this just shows the main roads. Okay. Yeah. So. Thank you. I forgot to ask. I, I was supposed to ask. I was supposed to ask Victoria every slide. If you okay, so this just shows some of the main roads that we're that we're working to connect. Okay, so main roads, and you can see on the left side of the screen we have sort of our downtown area, and then all the way over on to the right. That is that the bright red is the Taconic, or is that our is that the is that I think the, that's the, the Taconic. Taconic. Yeah. Okay, and then right near there is our um, the Empire State Trail slash North County Trail. All right. And so just the important in this section, um, Tracy, when she was putting together this plan in the study area section, she um, took out excerpts from the comprehensive plans of the three municipalities, just highlighting that this whole project is very important and is well established in some of the goals of um, each municipality. And yeah, and in, and indeed, if you if you take a look at the plan, you will see how it directly intersects with each one of our comprehensive plans, uh, very specifically. And some of the 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 plan also talks about some of the existing conditions, um, specifically a lot of our north south connect connected paths like the old Croton Aqueduct like the North County Trailway, like the Briarcliff Peekskill Trailway, which we were just talking about earlier with Lori. And um, there's lots of, uh, you know, even, you know, we're, we're starting to see uh, the, also there's the, um, is that the mouse that's moving? Because there's something. Oh, there's a little no, something fly. fly. It's a fly. fly. I, know, it's like, <laughs> like, I thought it was like a mouse. Yeah, it does. I was like, yeah, it does. Yeah, I was like why, why are we doing that? Are you trying to show me something? With <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's just a little bug. Okay. Fly is um, Right. So, so there's a lot of different pieces that this um, would help in terms of um, being an east-west connector that, that actually pulls all of these pieces together. And I know I'm missing a couple here, but it also... Um, ties into T-Town Reservation, Warburg Park, Gedney Park, Mary Knoll, um, to name just a few. I'm thinking I'm, I'm missing some. Ryder Park, Crawbucky Nature Preserve. I do actually the think Bethany Arts, Community. Bethany Arts Community. And I actually think there's also a way to get to Cedar Lane Park as well. And then, of course, it's not that much it, to get to, back down to the waterfront. The reason that we haven't really, really, really focused on the waterfront, even though we know we want to get there, is because of the extremely steep slopes. But one of the pieces of this plan is also advocacy for e-bikes or pedal-assisted bikes um, that would, um, if they were to be allowed and, and um, legally allowed in New York State, even though they are here illegally, we think, um, they um, that would help certainly get people from the train station, the waterfront, up the hill, and into town. And start on the aqueduct trail or, exactly. and get to the rest of them. Exactly. So, um, okay, so anyway, the, so the plan highlights all these different pieces of connectivity. It also talks a lot about some of the, um, you know, some of the highlights on the old Croton Aqueduct um, and things that connect to, the, that connect up with it on the, in the north-south direction. So, you know, you could start at Kaika and bike up to Ossining and then decide you want to go cross over and spend the day at, um, theoretically, at T-Town. You know, if you could go along all of these different connectors or you want to get over to the Empire State Trail, which is the governor's big push to um, be sort of an outstanding open space um, and recreation area that connects from Niagara Falls, I think, all it's the way. Is Manhattan it? all the way up to Canada. Right. Um, and then it also connects to the um, the Erie Canal area, so it kind of goes west. Yeah, they've got some of those areas really pretty, really yeah. nicely fixed up as I've right. been driving back and forth to Buffalo. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, I think one of the reasons that the DOT was excited to work on this was because it could almost be used for them as a pilot to look at other pieces of the Empire State Trail and how you could connect with um, different assets for 
villages and towns, cities, whatever, um, all, you know, throughout New York State. So they really liked the, the idea of having this east-west connector, um, which is why they kind of jumped in uh, to work with us on it. Um, and the Empire State Trail in Westchester is the North County Trailway, pretty much. Okay. So it really directly connects to what they are planning to be the, 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 the focal point of this trailway in Westchester County. And also, um, you can see that there are commercial areas and open space that have been highlighted. I think that the, well, I can, I can barely read it, but the historic downtown Crescent in downtown Ossing, Croton Avenue and Route 134, Millwood, North State Road, Arcadian Plaza, Camp Woods, Chilmark, and Pleasantville Road, to name just a few, are highlighted. And then all of uh, the various parks and uh, land preserves like T-Town, um, Crawbucky, etc. You can you can sort of see, see some of the ones that I just mentioned. We held some community workshops, with, which some of you attended, and um, out of that, the top five priorities of the attendees were access to existing bike trails and parks, access to open space and parks, intersection safety, pedestrian safety, and um, bike lanes that are actually demarcated and make you feel safer when you're biking. So we, we conducted a survey. Do you feel your community would benefit from increasing access and safety for pedestrians on roadways? And surprise, surprise, uh, almost everybody said yes. And do you currently feel safe biking or walking in your community? Not so many people said yes to that. So this plan um, is a way that would make us realize safer biking um, and pedestrian access in our communities. Um, and so the survey, these are just two um, questions that were part of the survey. It was something that we had done online, and we also offered to the attendees at the workshop. And if they came in the office and they wanted to fill it out, they were welcome to as well. Um, and I think we got close to 100 res uh, respondents, if I remember correctly. I don't have the number off the top of my head. It was pretty, pretty impressive, um, but again, the, some of the priorities that were pulled out of the workshops were reiterated in the survey. I know um, one of the number one items that people said needed to be changed to make them want to bike or walk in Austin was something like bike lanes or safer access. So everything kind of mirrored each other, what we saw in the surveys and what we saw in the workshops. And I just wanted to read you a couple of the, the, the um quotes from people who responded to either came to our workshops or responded to the survey. They said it would help reduce greenhouse gases, make roads less congested and increase healthy options, increases property value to make our town as family friendly and green as possible. More options for transportation, the better. Safety is the key. All the access in the world won't make a difference until safety is improved. If that happens, the community would be much more green, vibrant and even friendlier. I think having a more bikeable community would increase the quality of life for residents. People would be more calm. Roads would be less crowded because people would take their bike, etc. And car transportation is nearly faceless and impersonal. Cycling and walking cause people to interact with their fellow, fellow community members with a pleasant smile, a warm hello, and perhaps a helping hand with a flat tire or heavy package. Cycling and walking build a stronger community. To get this bike lane, you're going to have to get involved with somebody's property. Not necessarily. Um, and if you take a look at it, in some pieces of, of the um, plan, which we're not, even, I'm not really quite up to that portion yet, um, but in some pieces of the plan, you might have to get some, get some permissions. But it's, it's all, I think all of it was within the um, state rule, right, the state right of way. So um, right? when we, yeah, when we when we take a look at the the um, the detailed plan from the state, um, especially in the village of Austin, where they kind of get, they gave us design concepts for the entire length of 133 from um, from Route 9 to to Route 100, and in the village of Austin section, the recommendations they were giving didn't actually widen the road at all. It was curb to curb recommendations to to kind of help in the cost area to make it a little less expensive, a little less cost burdensome to, to implement. Farther out in the in the town of Austin and the town of Newcastle would require some road widening, but again, they were aiming to stay within the, the state's right of way, essentially. 
So, yes, I mean, even when you stay in a right of way, sometimes you do have to disturb some pro property that might be within the right of way. Um, and usually when you do that, that's something that you would engineer for and you would have to figure out how to do it to, you know, I mean, it's like even like on McCarthy where we want to make the road correct, we're going to have to disturb somebody's detail that they put in their driveway to make the road correct, but, you know, we're going to fix it and put it in a little farther further in. That's That would be the plan how we would do that. Same kind of thing that we would have to look at if we were looking at road widening. And there there are the other part of, I mean, we haven't sort of gotten up to the 133 um, discussion yet, but, you know, I would like everybody to take a look at that feasibility evaluation and sort of, you know, maybe give some feedback on it. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look through it, you don't have, you know, I'm not expecting that you do tonight, but, um, if you could give some, give up, give some feedback, I think that that will be helpful, especially on the part that's within unincorporated. Um, but for those of us who are also village residents, you know, um, village Rossing residents, feel free to weigh in on that too. And I think um, we're hope, hoping that we will um, hear back. There's it, the potential to phase in also, you know, what we could do theoretically if we were to get buy-in from all the municipalities um, to start down the path of um, engineering and design of some of these, it's possible that you start with the share the lane where Sharrows, is that what it's called? Um, it's the first the, concept. The concept where you share lanes and you just you just basically paint mm -hmm. like they do in New York City. You know, you paint spots like share the road kind of um, on the on the ground, right? And, and you have some signage. And then as you start seeing more ridership, more usership, you then say, okay, you know what, we're going to move the parking off of from here and we're, you know, we're going to have to figure out where we're going to put the parking that is working here because we have so many people now who are cycling. And I actually took a picture recently because I was walking on uh, the aqueduct of all of the bicycles that are at Avalon right now. And um, I was amazed as at their little... Um, bike rack that they have on the property of Avalon that was is overflowing with bicycles. So again, I think that this speaks to uh, a, a new wave, a new um, trend, probably I'm guessing from millennials versus the empty nesters, but maybe also empty nesters who are not only looking for recreation, but are looking to utilize their bicycle as a mode of transportation. Um, to avoid having to rent a car or, or rent a, an Uber or Lyft yeah, for or whatever. Parking at the current train station. Right, any of those things. So it may be, <laughs> it could, you know, again, possibly be just what you said, a commuter, um, a way to commute to the train station, a way to get around locally and not have to pay or own another vehicle, pay for or own another vehicle. Yeah, and so then that kind of takes us to the ski map idea that you were referring to earlier. Right, so um, I had mentioned that with that other map that... Um, the notion that there are different reasons that somebody might choose to to cycle or, or you go on foot, but we're looking to create this sort of uh, map of connectivity that would look at different roads and their um, topography um, and their cycleability, and we would come up with uh, either an app or a map or, or something that would help people get from point A to point B with a per with the kind of purpose that they were going to be using it for. So if they're using it for a commuter and they need to get there as fast as possible, if they're looking for a long ride, you know, for their, they're a cyclist and they're training for a, a triathlon. triathlon, for example, or something um, that your husband might be busy doing. Um, or, uh, or if they're going out for a ride with the kids in their little trailer in the back or just want to go out for a nice day, um, and end up at the ice cream shop in Yorktown, which is what we used to do with our kids. And, you know, they want to get, they, they don't feel like putting their car, you know, driving their car there. They want to get to the um, trailway safely. How can they do that and add in that little extra bit uh, from their home to get there or their, or their apartment or, you know, whatever that they want to do from downtown um, or the, or even if they want to come up for the day and if they wanted to go, so or spend can overnight. we get the grant to provide um, maps like this that could be at the trailheads to show people which one, you know, intersections of these different 
trails, which one goes there, maybe even a little uh, pamphlet that the biker could take with them to say that goes this way, that goes that way, or or an app that they could download onto yep. their phone. Yeah, definitely. Um, because the there need to be is, seems to there be need to be a few signs like there are on some of the trails, like T Town, where okay, this this goes here, and this is where you can end up. Yeah. And I mean that we want to help people find the bike routes, and we also want to help them connect to our commercial districts. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So, so specifically, there's actually mm -hmm. um, a piece of property that we own at mm -hmm. um, that's right on the North County Trailway mm -hmm. at Chappaqua Road, like if you cross One of our wells. 100, mm -hmm. um, and that's a perfect place mm -hmm. to put a kiosk. Mm -hmm. um, perfect. That would direct people to North State Road, for example. Exactly. Um, and could direct people, mm -hmm. you know, to go to Briarcliff, and could direct mm -hmm. people to, you know, come up here, come over here, go to Yogalicious, is that the one? Mm -hmm. it's hilarious. I don't know. What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is okay. Excellent. I don't know. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, you know, or, 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 or the bagel shop, or the pizza place, or whatever. Um, you know, you stop here for lunch, stop here for a bite, you bite, and then you can hop back onto the trail, and here's how you can do it. So we would, you know, like to do that. Right, I'd like to see a lot of those. And we'd also, we also, you know, we received grant funding mm -hmm. through the, um, Clean Energy Communities, mm -hmm. right? yep, yep. Uh, grant uh, the Clean Energy Communities process for fifty thousand dollars to stripe North State Road because we thought that would be the easiest way for us to begin to start mm -hmm. showing um, people how you know mm -hmm. to make those connections and make it safer for by, for, for cyclists. So what are we doing that. Um, we're ready. We ready just to finally go. just got the money approved. I think mm -hmm. last week. Um, so we are now going to mm -hmm. hire. We need to go out and hire an engineer. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So we're we going to reach out to the local businesses to, like, say, the auto repair shop to say, hey, you can get air for your bicycle tire here. Maybe put up a little sign or something and make it easier for bikers. Yeah. Or we're going to have bike racks. That would be the other thing. Yeah, bike racks outside the dance stop studio or, or something, you know. Well, right, the, other, the other thing that's interesting, um, if it's your own bike, right, but lime i think is the company yeah there's a bunch yeah. of companies there's like all that. these companies now coming in with the um dockless bike dockless shares bike, um bike share programs that are coming up to westchester and we're actually hoping to work with them on this car uh free day that i had I think i had mentioned mm -hmm. at the yeah. last meeting for september 21st the village and town and green austin are, are trying to work with um uh, five on one new york ride share to um talk you know to promote uh this car car free day in um Austin and we're reaching out to Lyme to see if we can maybe work with them potentially for the day uh, as a little mini pilot and see if you know we get any takers um so that might be another thing that we're you don't actually need a bike rack right. but it also means that we might have to consider some policies around where you're allowed to put your dockless bike because some of the communities that have recently find a dockless bike you don't need to put it into one of those have you seen the city bike program no the city okay so <laughs> the city has these these docks these stations where oh you okay no i saw that when it was there i don't know if you put your credit card in or whatever, in there or whatever. Yeah, yeah you put it in yeah, yeah, yeah that's all right. right. <laughs> I was gonna comment. Thank you. Okay, okay. credit card. It was really cute. It was cute. A quarter. Yes. Yeah, you put your quarter in and you go on the little ride. Um, but now you don't need. A lot of these companies are having dockless stations, so the bike doesn't move until your credit card goes. Until your credit card is somehow connected with the bike, you do, or there's an app. So as soon as you pay, you can take bike one thirty three or whatever it is. I don't know why I said that number. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I haven't done that. Anyway, you could take bike 133 and you can go and drop it. You have like some restrictions station. where you can drop it, but a lot of, a lot of that may be somewhat problematic. So yes, we yeah. do need to consider, um, putting in some bike, um, and it's in white plains already. Probably. So it's, it's something where you like, again, it's, it's a, it's a program that doesn't have any boundaries. So it's in the city of white plains right now, but you can start in the city of White Plains with your dockless bike and drive and ride it wherever you want. I was at the Hastings Farmer's Market a couple weeks ago, and there was one in Hastings. So people are driving them, picking them up in White Plains, and starting to ride them throughout Westchester County, and it becomes more accessible spreading out throughout the county. So that's kind of a, a neat feature of it is that it's not restricted to, you know, New York City is city bike. You can't leave New York City with your city bike. You can It can become a more widespread community effort. 
to have these I think I'd like to see spikes. that. That'd be good here because once you ride around often, if you go down to the train station, you're not going to ride back up. There. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that would be, you know, part Sleeping of it. That's what we're saying. There. Unless you have that pedal assist bike, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So, continuing on. Um, and also, just I just want to let you know that we got a lot of feedback about these routes from people who are avid cyclists. So, um, for example, Mitzi Elks and her husband are, are, are very avid cyclists. So is Kate Marshall. Right, I was talking about um, that. Right, and so there are a lot of people who are avid cyclists have been um, interested in, in this plan and have given us feedback about the routes that they think are the best or the ones that are most like that they're most likely to take because they feel that they're the safest. And also ones that, again, that are sort of the low-hanging fruit. Um, so as we were mentioning, New York State Department of Transportation um, underwent and did, um, came up with the feasibility evaluation of Route 133 um, with a number of options um, and a number of sections. They divided it into sections, I think, from Route 9 to Ramapo Road, Ramapo Road to 9A, uh, and then 9A to what, Route 100. Um, those were the sections that they demarcated, and then they came up with different recommendations. Um, one, two, and three. Am I saying they're? I'm, I'm yeah, something like something that. Something like that. There are basically three recommendations for how we could address um, the different the different types of ways that we could address bike lanes. And again, some of it is with striping. Some of it is actually creating a separate lane on either side of the road, and then one is creating a lane like for two bikes to go in both directions on one side of the road. And um, well, so it's important the concept three that they came up with, I think it's three or C, um, is only for the portion of 133 that's past 9A, mm -hmm. um, where you'd be doing significant roadway improvements to create a bike lane that's divided from the road. So that's like the best plan, but of course the most expensive and the most burdensome to deal with issues like right of ways and so on and so forth. So they just gave us these recommendations that if we were to implement these recommendations, it's feasible that 133 could be designated as a state designated by group, which would be really significant and it would be approved by the state as a roadway that could be used for bicycling. So anyway, the, it takes us through the some of the existing conditions of the roadways and then um, the, the concepts as well as some of um, the safety has some accident um, data in it as well. And uh, again, if you haven't had a chance to sort of take a look at it, um, I'd appreciate it if everybody did get a, take a, look, a deeper dive into it. Um, it also has some preliminary construction estimates, not including the right of way or engineering costs. And um, one of the things that we did is cool. We threw our patent ring for some tap. Not quite yet. Almost. <laughs> We've almost to, our hat for ring. them to evaluate. <laughs> we we did is um, through the transportation alternatives, alternatives program. program, which is a state program but federal dollars. Um, so federal dollars that siphon through the state. There's some large chunks of money that are available, and they do like bike routes, but we aren't sure if we are far enough along yet to consider, to be considered for some of this money. So what we did is we kind of tossed our, an application in. Yeah, we put in a pre-application. <laughs> There's a pre-review period when they say, if you get it in now, you get extra points. So we said, all right, let's get something in almost like a placeholder and get some feedback from them to see if, you know, we can, we're going to kind of tickle this and see if we can get um, them to show an interest and to say, and then come back to us and say, you know what? No, you're not even close. You know, you need to do a lot more work before you can apply for this grant. Or if they say, yes, here's, you know, but you know, you need to do X, Y, Z. Exactly. So at least we know where we st stand. So we, we kind of threw that in, in the mix and we'll see what happens with that. Um, and the other things that we're applying for, which we are going to talk about just right after this, um, as part of this, the consolidated funding application process, which is the one that Lori was saying, you know, is due next week. One of the um, grants that we're asking, that we're applying for, is part of the um, clean energy communities. That's what, you know, they all have different yeah. little 
uh, buckets or whatever that you apply under the clean energy communities where we were going to ask for money for to do a comprehensive plan with sustainability elements and a bike plan so we would uh, that would be another area where we would um, be tapping for planning money to get in do a deeper dive for the big for the bigger um, amount not bigger I, amounts but the bigger um, loops. loops like all okay. of the different loops so we could start get you know really saying okay you know this is what we need to do this is how where we would want to stripe this is how you know where we want to have signage etc throughout throughout awesome one last thing is that the, the plan includes um, a number of goals and recommendations that also just go beyond the first one, obviously, is to implement the, the trail plan that we, we had on that map earlier, but also just some other um, recommendations that we have that would further um, Austin becoming a more bikeable or walkable community. And number three is what um, Supervisor Levenberg is referring to in terms of the next grant application is including bicycling in our climate smart communities planning, which is the grant program that we're referring to. So there's a lot of tie-ins to great grant opportunities and just good things to make Austin a more bikeable community. Um, and so once uh, the town board considers adopting this plan, we can kind of turn to in grant applications and say, okay, what we're applying for right here is a recommendation that has been made by this trail committee in this plan that is a policy document for the town of Austin. So it certainly bolsters any application we apply for, any grant funding that we seek to say that this is, this is set in stone, this is what the town intends to do and wants to implement with this funding. Okay. Any grants that help us get to these numbers would be very helpful. Well, and the TAP grant is a big one. So. Yeah, well, the TAP grant is And there's one. Tiger, but that's, I don't know. That's like ever. big, that's big. <laughs> really, really big. Yes. Um, so again, please take some time to review this and give us some feedback and hopefully um, we can put it um, what we'd like to do is put it on one of our meetings for adoption in the near future. All right. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing I just wanted to quickly um, mention are the other uh, consolidated funding ap application uh, grants that we're planning to apply for. The, and I have my notes someplace and here they are okay so uh, we are hoping to apply for a food scrap collection program um, we're thinking about doing something similar to what the town of Greenberg has done and they also applied through the CFA process last year for a grant they partnered with the Greenberg Nature Center to help with the education component of their food scrap recycling program it's been very very successful the advantage to um, having one of these programs it's an opt-in program so people choose to basically bring their food scraps and we had a discussion about this you remember with um, the um, Scarsdale folks and then I took a visit to the Scarsdale yard and I've also been to the Marinette yard and those programs are all on their DPW yards which we do not have um, as of yet it might be something in the future that we do, but right now we don't. So the um, we were looking at Town of Greenberg because they did it in a town park, and um, they have a collection site similar to what they have at the other places. And then they have um, I, we were in just had some discussions recently with Greenberg Nature Center and T Town because we thought T Town might be interested in partnering with us on this, but um, we're not 100% sure. We feel like we might not need them to partner with us on this because we can actually put money in the grant for up uh, to hire somebody to do some oversight one of the things that everybody has at their yard is somebody making sure that the food scraps are correctly sorted and, and that the bins are closed because we basically put out bins where people then come and drop their scraps and then you put the one that's all full in the back and move the one that's empty to the for to the front and you have a little spot that's demarcated and people have whatever the hours of your you that we determine they could come and collect the stuff and then we would get some uh, carter to pick it up right now the only place to bring the food scraps is to Ulster County they have a very very large composting facility up in Ulster um, and but it's a long haul to get up there and that's where the, the cost came in as you remember we did go out as part of the RFP to see if our 
Um, we could include it in our refuse and recycling um, bid, but it was way too expensive. So we're looking at applying for to this grant to see if we can. And this will offset other costs for us in the long run because the weight of food scraps is one of the heaviest components of our garbage. So, and we pay for our dumping by weight. So um, that would hopefully be an offset in the long run. When you went to Greenberg, was there a smell associated with that? I did not go to Greenberg, but the other ones ah. that I went to, there's absolutely no smell. There is no smell associated. The, okay. the only smell that there is is from their yard from garbage. So how, do you, how do you keep the animals out of there? They're uh, that one guy stands there with a broom. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're, they're secured. They, none of them have had problems with animals. I don't remember if it was a bungee cord or something, but all of the bins are, are secured shot. So they, I think they might have like a bungee, uh, sorry, bungee cord um, that keeps them shut. And they have no, none of these uh, well, other I, communities I have had problems. Around my house, I'll see them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're very, we have a bear out they're there. very secure bins. So. <laughs> They know how to open cans. <laughs> they yeah, them. they're smart. Yeah, I have one that loves my garbage. The other um, couple of grants that we were applying for, one is um, a new salt shed, and that's from Water Quality. It's the same and, program that Lori was speaking of. Yeah, right. Same mm -hmm. program that Westchester Land Trust is applying for. Um, and the um, we're also, as part of our capital planning, we were planning to repave three parking lots in our parks next year for at Cedar Lane, Gerlach, and Ryder, um, some of the bigger lots by the pavilion. Well, by the pavilion. And we're looking to see if it's um, feasible. We're working with um, our engineer, Dan Sierra, to see if it's feasible to do some sort of a permeable pavers or bioswale to make our um, parking lots less... Um, impactful on our storm drains. Um, so we're hoping that we can, again, apply for that. We're still working that through. Um, the other one, as I mentioned, the comp plan with sustainable, sustainability elements and a bike plan. And that's part of the um, clean energy communities. Climate smart communities. Climate smart communities. I, I said the right one before. <laughs> and, um, and then finally, also part of climate smart communities, uh, Cedar Lane Park, um, the Ice House, and and the greenhouses, um, re refurbishing them for use, either rentable use or as a. Uh, that's the New York State Parks program, so it doesn't necessarily have a sustainability element to this project okay. necessarily. Okay. <laughs> Just yeah. <laughs> so those are the five that we're hoping to get accomplished by next week, and we have a plan. And last week we approved the um, our grant writer, so we're hoping. Um, and, and we're, we've been working with all with all of the necessary parties to pull this together. Um, so, um, and so yeah, we're still ironing out some of the details on all these different applications. But a few of them will require the town board to adopt a resolution to endorse the application. Um, so which we'll in have the coming on, which days, we'll have, yeah, um, next Tuesday. I'll be yeah, correct. Carry out exactly. Tuesday, Tuesday. Tuesday yeah. will be approving a lot of resolutions. <laughs> a lot of grant resolutions for, for grant. So, yeah. and that is. It, as far as that's concerned, um, next up, we want to talk about our draft plan for the leaf blower legislation, which would limit. Oh, uh, first, we want to talk about the, the roofs. Oh, sorry. Okay, yes. Well, both, yeah, roof right. updates. So, so uh, we had been talking and, and we um, approved a plan to work with Stephen Tilly Architects on um, over, uh, on doing some work at the superintendent's cottage. Mm -hmm. At the Al Cemetery, um, we had a little bit of sticker shock, and we have since um, reached out to the village's uh, roof expert to evaluate the roof at uh, the superintendent's cottage, because that's one of the pieces that's sort of most critical to fix. Who is the village's roof expert? Russ Swatsky. Okay. But okay, just but he, to he's from... He has okay. a consultant, yes, and yeah, he's worked consultant. also with the um, Stephen Tilly architect. So we're not quite straying from. I mean, Stephen Tilly, when they when they gave us recommendations for cost estimates, they hadn't fully assessed the roof um, to the degree that Russ was able to. So so we so he came in and he took a look at the roof there as well as the roof at the ice house because the ice house has a big hole in it, and we're concerned that you know the longer that you let these things go, the more likely it is that you can't. Fix it. Yeah, Fix it. Yeah. So you got to you got to take care of the envelopes of your buildings. Um, so he came back with a very um, 
So for the superintendent's cottage, um, he determined that we do not need to replace the roof at this time. There's a leak. Um, there's a few repairs that need to be made, but ultimately he came up with an estimate of $950 to do those repairs. So Pete is moving forward. Um, and then for the ice house, it's a little more extensive, um, but he is anticipating that those costs are being in the range of $10,000 to make the repairs to the ice house because there are some areas that are significantly damaged. It's going to require some carpentry work before putting on new slate tiles. Um, they also don't have any gutters in the on the ice house right now. Um, so he'd be looking to replace the gutters and leaders in some areas of the of the building that would make the most sense so that it all goes. So we, we may have to do that before this the grant application for Is some the of that storm damage from the spring. Um, I think it's been there. For yeah, the ice house has been in disrepair for quite some time. No, yeah, yeah and I know that they fix up part of it, but that's the same area that the boat's got the trees on them. So I was just wondering if. No, it's been. No, I think you it's don't been. Remember, you don't remember me thinking that there was actually a tree growing out of the ice house. Oh no, that's a green. <laughs> nope, that was. No, oh, the ice house too. There's also trees there growing out of the ice. house. That there are house. trees growing out of that. But I had yeah. the pictures of. Them. Yeah, yeah, but no, I meant I actually there was a. A tree that had fallen in such a way that it looked like it was. Oh, okay, lovely. <laughs> Quite some time. Um, so, I guess we that, should fix it. Yes, yeah, so we'll be moving forward asking Russ. Well, you know, because it's ten thousand dollars, we'll need three quotes for it. So, so we'll be moving forward to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that it now. From yeah, unless you have any questions about that. Then the next up is the leaf blower legislation, um, we, which would limit the time of year as well as the time of day in which the town would permit leaf blowers to be operated. While we did not have anyone address us at the um, public hearing last time, we have received some feedback from community residents as well as staff with suggestions which we would like to discuss tonight. And we anticipate we'll continue to hear more from the public, so we will let the discussion continue. Um, meanwhile, have any of my colleagues had time to review some of the feedback that we've received and do you have any thoughts on the matter and or um, our council have prepared a memo with some suggestions and some talk, some thoughts if we wanted to discuss. Right. I really liked uh, at the, what the count, what Christy provided. I um, thought it was clear and succinct and most of her suggestions I agree with. Um, and then I know there's a bunch of things we need to do. So, uh, not starting it right away so people have time to adjust the equipment they buy. But announcing it, I thought was a good idea. I liked keeping the May 15th date as opposed to changing it to the earlier May 1st date. Just Agreed. If we have, a, like we had this year, this kind of late spring, mm -hmm. the May 1st date would have been tough. And that was also something I think that, that Pete, um, Conley had suggested he, he didn't want to go earlier. Although I do think that um, Christy had suggested maybe going uh, later, as in June, I don't know I June thought first because you were you know right after uh, Memorial Day. Memorial I thought Day that people way. may be having barbecues. They may wait till then to kind of do their cleanup stuff for the spring. I you know I don't have a house, so I'll defer to you guys. <laughs> Well, you want it clean by Memorial Day. That's the thing. Or they may do it like around that period of time. So if you give them that time to do it or, you know, they have their three day weekend. Let me take the time to kind of get my house in order. I mean, it's a difference mm -hmm. of 15 days. It was just something that I thought may be relevant. I actually thought June 1st was a good suggestion. I think if we put May 30th. 31st. May 31st. Thank you. May 31st it would be uh, less offensive to our people and it's only a difference of a day and still says may okay i know <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that Funny that it um also your suggestion of regulating decibel levels i thought was a good one um and i was also i'm also just wondering about electric versus gas which you didn't really tackle here but i think some of the municipalities regulate the gas leaf blower so if we were to regulate the decibel levels and gas i think then the well, leaf blower is designed is that defined to be electric gas diesel or similar similar fuel engine so right. but i'm saying some of the municipalities it doesn't say all leaf blowers it says gas powered leaf blower 
Oh, so you want to further restrict what you're putting the regulations on. Right. I'm saying maybe what we do is we regulate the gas-powered leaf blowers. Uh -huh. Those are the ones that are, like, are the most powerful and the most offensive. And then we have these decibel restrictions. So then, you know, if you have an electric, right, then if you, right, if you have electric leaf blowers, you still have limitations. But, you know, in terms of hours or whatever, but you're not completely, you're not, like, you're, you're basically saying you, could, you can use electric leaf blowers because they are less powerful and they're not as noisy, even though they still are. Just to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So the moratorium over the summer months would not apply to the electric and it would only the restrictions that we, that are talked about in subsection C about the times of day and decibel levels and whatnot, if, if, if the board chooses to right. include that, I mean, that's would just apply a to that. Suggestion. Um, because I think that, you know, that's sort of a direction that I, I think that's at least I, I, that's how I had read some of the other the other um, municipalities were spe specifically gas powered. Yeah, I think I think we could start with gas powered. And if the electric still becomes seem to be a problem, then we can include them later. But they're, they're already gas powered. Yeah. They are gas powered now. I get rid of the gas, keep the electric. Oh, oh, oh. I, that's, you know, I, again, I don't know, but that that's all sounds well and good. But, to, but people have some awful big lungs around here. You want to get electric out to those? So, again, some of the bigger properties we're, we're talking about the restrictions are, are different on those bigger properties, right? And a lot of those are the um, drive on, right? People use ride on. Thank you. What, the, the uh, mower? I guess the ride on lawn mower. I guess it's just blower. mower, not the blower. They're still using the backpack blowers. Yeah. And, and There's this, battery powered. Um, but then, there are well, push ones also. But they're by gas. The push. Uh, yeah, the push ones are gas. Right. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that... But these are only for the summer months. This is not for leaf picking up. Right. This is only for leaf lawn clippings. Right. So, so you get to use them. It's only from somewhere in May to somewhere in September, which is what we're talking about. Right. You think they need them all year round? I don't think there should be a restriction. When you, when you, need, a, when you need to do something, you can't wait two months to do it. So there were some discussions about having exemptions for emergency situations. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Which doesn't currently exist, but that may alleviate some of your concerns if um, it was proposed that under certain circumstances, um, the highway superintendent or designate some town official with the authority to um, give people the option of using it in certain circumstances. They talk about storms or other types of events. I know in Pete's memo, um, he talked about after they have certain specific events and ceremonies at the cemetery that he expressed a need to use them for. I, I mean, I honestly think we should exempt, the, especially the cemetery, um, for sure, from a lot of this because of the nature of how a cemetery is. It's much different than any other kind of property. And um, I know that, um, we, you know, many of the municipalities also do exempt their, um, all of their municipal entities, even though it's, it seems a little contradictory. Um, the reason being is the, you know, ultimately the cost for, for taxpayers is greater if you just count on having to rake one of the things from our friends, you know, our environmental community, the point that they make is if we start shifting the, the dialogue and basically pushing many of the landscape companies to do mulch in place or love them and leaf them, right, where you leave a lot of the leaves, you don't have to blow everything, um, that's better for the environment and it's less expensive in the long run. So 
a lot of um, you know our parks department does mulch in place they have the, mul the mowers that mulch and mow at the same time so they don't really have to do a lot of blowing most of the stuff that they're doing is cleaning off um, pave paved areas um, for you know for safety and you know again I think the cemetery is just a little different because of all of the stones that they have to get around they're not ta talking about large tracts of land so they have been doing they have they do some mulch in place but I think it's just harder for them whether it's raking or whatever because of all the stones um, so again it seems like it makes sense to have exceptions for those municipal entities that that are particularly um, tricky and or time-consuming. I agree that the cemetery should be exempt. And, I mean, there, there's you also have the um, lot parcel. The size, you know, if you're R40 or R30, you're exempt right. because I mean, it's a big property. It reminds me. I couldn't get the leaves off my property with a leaf blower. Just have tried it. It didn't work. Just to clarify, um, but that's different time of year, right? The, it's not ex the way it's drafted. Um, D subsection D says this section, so everything shall not apply to the following entities and activities, and then it lists a whole host of them, including cemeteries. Um, whereas um, what Councilwoman Feldman was talking about was that the two or more leaf blowers shall not be allowed to be operated simultaneously except in the R40 and R30 residential districts, which are your larger 30,000 um, square foot and 40,000 square foot, which are okay. comparable to almost an acre. Um, but that restriction on the two or more leaf blowers except in those larger residential districts is for when it is permitted by law. Right. So that doesn't take those residential districts, those larger districts, um, it, yeah. out of the exemption that you're not allowed to use it during this time period. Whereas currently, the way it's drafted, everything in subsection D is exempt from both B and C. And so I think that was another thing that I had brought to your, to your attention or something you may want to consider is, first of all, do you want everything that's currently listed in D to be exempt? And what do you want it to be exempt from? You know, these, these so, may not be things that you right. may need to think about, you know. Right. And so let's just, I just want to go, so we received a lengthy letter also from Donna Sherritt um, about some suggestions that she had, um, and I think, you know, some of them are worth considering. I just want to look at Pete's again. Pete had said, so the new technology is not there yet for all such large areas. The cemetery, a large cemetery landscaping company tried using battery trimmers but the motors wouldn't hold up battery equipment is fine for homeowners with small properties but not practical for larger areas he's saying if adopted there has to be an exemption for cleanup after a storm or unique situation and he was considering the unique situation chinese memorial day new year where their tradition is to place fake money on the graves and that blows around the rest of the property so they have to use they use the leaf blowers to uh, get rid of that um they must be able to clean the roadways in pervious surfaces year-round from grass clippings, dirt, and leaves, which drop from trees that are old and stressed from heat or disease. Um, they want He wanted to extend the, the restriction be, begin May 15th through October 1st. And those, I think, are his main suggestions. And uh, I think also, Chrissy, you suggested that, you know, this wouldn't go into effect until next May, essentially. That's that's the way I drafted it. I think it, that yes. makes sense. Um, and um, Pete was saying you phase it in, and I think that that would be the phase in and education period. Um, and then also some of the suggestions, some, you know, Bedford 2020 recently um, did – and pushed out an education campaign, leaf blowers time for change, and talked about the hazards of gas-powered leaf blowers. And then they had a meeting for landscapers in December um, to discuss with them about the leaf blower use. Um, 
And another way in which it would be phased in is if you do incorporate this regulating of gas leaf blowers to a greater extent than electric. Right. It so we can start people some options. Right. So right. we can start with the regulating the gas leaf blowers and then maybe add in the electric, you know, or the battery pack, whatever the battery. Um, See how the technology evolves over time. Right. So gas powered and, and decibels, like Maddie was saying. Because, you know, some of those electric ones are pretty loud. So, and as far as, um, I think that, so, so just to go back to some of Donna's um, suggestions, she was saying she does not think that we should um, have an unlimited amount of leaf blowers allowed on R40 and R30. She's, Donna Sherrick, she's saying like her, her, her neighbors have, you know, that she's in these districts, they're not that big, her house fills with exhaust fumes and the noise is unbearable. And again, I think she's talking about gas-powered leaf blowers specifically. Um, so I think if we were to limit the number of gas-powered leaf blowers, even on those large properties, that wouldn't necessarily but harm us. To and I don't know, when they're doing my yard, the two of them point. Converge, I don't know what they did, but they, they converge because there's just so many heavy leaves. I mean, I get, I have all huge trees. And there's no way you're blowing it in one direct. They need to blow from two different sides to get it out to the road. There's no other way to do it. I've tried with one leaf blower. It didn't work out well. So, um, I mean, but I have an R40, so I do have a bigger piece. I have a half acre. I can see where it would be necessary. Otherwise, the landscape is going to be there forever for twice as long, using just as many emissions, but for a longer period of time. I can't mulch my leaves in place. There are too many leaves. I have tried. You can't leave all that on your lawn. No, I really can't. I have huge 200-year-old oak trees, and I mulch the first three sets, the first three falls, and then after that, I just can't. But even after you mulch... And I still have, you know, five feet deep in the front. You your lawn, and, and even after two or three mowings of mulching, you're going to have to rake or do something. You can't keep leaving it there. Yeah, it's completely solid. Mulched. It doesn't work in my yard. It, it don't work. It builds up. Okay. So you guys... And I like mulching. Do you want to, so you want to keep the two, allow two for the R40 and R30? Yeah. Versus four. Or unlimited. Right now, yeah, right now it's drafted as two or more shall not be allowed simultaneously, but then that restriction does not apply in R40 or R30. So I can restructure that so that two or more are not allowed to be operated simultaneously, except in those districts where up to two may be operated simultaneously. That makes sense. Yeah. Or, no, that went over my head. She's, she basically <laughs> right now it's unlimited number for R30 and R40. Okay. And I think the suggestion is that we just say two. Limit it to two. Anyway. At the same time, simultaneously. Well, that's that's another thing for the board to consider. Um, right now, right now, it's basically saying you can't use more than one in a res in any residential district. Two or more shall not be allowed simultaneously, which is basically saying you can only use one. Except, Except in, those in the R30 or R40 where okay. you can use, where that restriction doesn't apply. So that would mean that you can Unlimited. use as much as you want. Okay, so so you thing. want to stick with one in, in the smaller. smaller residential districts and then two, two, three, what number are you thinking about for those larger districts? I went down Spring Street on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon. And there were three guys out there with those blowers blowing the sidewalks and in the middle of the street. Who landscapers are saying? I, I don't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't know that they do it all the time. But they may but be working for. Them. They may be working for a number of different homes, all at the same time. You know. So sometimes neighbors well, get together. So if you're working for three homes and you have three leaf blowers, it's probably okay. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, I saw three of them out there. Right. You know, right past the church. Right. Well, I mean, I look. I think I'm more interested in regulating it during the summer than I am nitpicking about what happens in the fall right now. I'd like to kind of at least start with not between these dates and, you know, not for your grass clippings, mulch your grass clippings in, and then see how it evolves. I mean, that's that's how I would do it. Well, we're still in that conversation. Yeah. 
I think we should limit it. So I think we should I limit. Think, I don't know if two is the number, but I think we should limit it. Okay. Like, I, but that what you're talking about, Northern, happens in my house. I, it's me, the house behind me, and the house next to me, and a house across the street. So there could be several people blowing because they're they've just cut four different lawns. I just saw. Right. I just see it. I don't pay attention. Yeah. To who right. Sees. But I do think that that happens where somebody it has like a, a bunch of the neighbors and then they come out and they do. Yeah, I used to share one with my neighbor right. and they come and do the whole thing together. Right. So. So does that present a whole different host of problems? Is how do you determine who's, who's doing what, what property? if you're if they're kind of doing it as this collective effort among multiple properties? seems like they just happen to be there at the same time. I don't know from what I'm gathering. Because like Jackie said, behind her house. And, and but it's all the same landscaper, though. It's oh, the same oh, guy oh, oh, that okay. does all four lawns. Oh, okay. But uh, I'm kind of connected to the person in the back, so they blow down from the back oh, okay. that way. So from an enforcement perspective, you know, you, we, we just want to think about how is that going to play out if someone, if you know, a police officer or someone is called out because someone's using four leaf blowers, but it actually turns out that they're doing four properties and just kind of handling it all at once. It's just, you know, these are issues that obvious that are good to flesh out now. I mean, the good news is we're not, we're not the first municipality to do this. There's a lot of municipalities where we, who have leaf flow legislation on the books already. Most, it seems to me like many of the Westchester communities have the specifically gas powered leaf blowers are the one are what's being regulated. And, and you this, were looking that's at where a lot of this came from was Rye? City of Rye and Larchmont, which was, were the two mo ones that were discussed most prominently when we had the work session about this. Right. Now, like the one, like I said, I saw three guys with these things. Now, if even if it's one company, if he cuts this down to one guy doing the blowing, it, it's gonna it's gonna cost his cost is gonna go up. Mm -hmm. Which means your cost. That's right, and it's that means everybody's cost going to go up, because because he with the three guys he he finish in an hour. One guy's going to take him maybe two hours or three hours, and I'm just throwing right. it out there. I, I just I, I don't know how. I'm, okay, so let's take a look at some other communities that are similar to us in terms of um, our economics um, so that we can see maybe, for example, Port Chester. Have, do they have anything on their books? Or um, I'm trying to think, maybe New Rochelle. So we'll make the distinction. If you're talking about this in terms of it being a corporate entity and you're not talking about the village. True, but mm, that's, well, true. that's absolutely true. true. Yeah. No, it's that's true. Right. No, you're right. You're right. And we don't have, we, but, but I, I feel like um, Councilman Walter is making uh, an economic justice argument. Um, you know, so is it, are we, you know, making it less, people less able to afford to take care of their property? And, you know, so I'm just saying that might, it might be worth looking at. I, I'd also like, I'm a little bit curious about Briar because I think that they just, had some new noise regulations that I think um, they just adopted recently um, just so that we can see what our neighbors have specifically. Um, because I think that, you know, part of this is also supply and demand. So when more communities say we are not going to allow gas powered leaf blowers, what happens is you drive demand for better electric leaf blowers and better, um, you know, equipment to mulch in place and better, um, in general, just better uh, processes that are more, you know, sustainable. And I think, you know, again, I think we all have to take these, these sorts of steps at the local level because a lot of these aren't being taken at the, certainly at the federal level. Um, and by doing so and by working together with other municipalities in Westchester, you're going to push the envelope and now, you know, everybody's going to start getting these other leaf blowers and the technology is going to improve because you need more people now to have this kind of technology that is safer, is quieter, is, um, you know, doesn't disturb Environmentally friendly. the land as much, all of the things that we need to know about leaf blowers to do. So again, I think that we're not the first ones to consider this. Let's just take a look at maybe what some of these other 
municipalities have done in terms of regulations to have less of an impact on people's pocketbooks. Um, and, and then maybe talk about some of the um, educational pieces that we could potentially borrow from some of these other communities that already have, have implemented this um, through our phase-in process. I think that um, some of the suggestions, the other suggestions from Donna Sharrett's memo were, I thought were good were just changing the language that from under certain cir circumstances, the leaf blower still serve a necessary function to under certain regulated circumstances, leaf blower still should be permitted. I, I have, thought that was a good suggestion. Have you had any more, uh, any other suggestions other than hers? Pete's, as I, I mentioned, Pete Connolly, and I think Susie Ross also weighed in um, with a. She was like a Madonna said, yeah. Who liked this, and I think she might have offered a couple of extra. Um, I can't remember if the EAC, did the EAC weigh in yet or not yet? Right. At Earth Day, oh, yeah. um, we had opened it up to the public to kind of put like little sticky notes on, and I think there were some comments there, but that's obviously not in reaction to this law as much as the concept in general. Um, and also, as someone pointed out, it's sort of like a self-selecting crowd, folks who are coming to Earth Day. So, um, but we can try to gather that in case that is of interest to anyone. Us, us sit here and do all this for one person. No, I, I've got a lot of feedback person. from, um, well, I've had one. quite a few conversations, and surprisingly to me, it's not necessarily always green-minded people. It's people who are working from home, um, who are having trouble with their conference calls and having trouble with their, um, with the quality of life, with the, with the noise from the leaf blowers, and they're not really even care what it's doing in the environment, it's their environment. They're concerned within their you know their homework is, environments. We were out there with jackhammers all week, <laughs> and I mean, they start at seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Is that and allowed? When you were, is that loud? Is that allowed? <laughs> yeah, that's that. They can't start before. And and I tell you, and not just in the morning before I'm up. You cannot watch TV. You can't do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So what you do is get out of the house and, and leave. I want to share also that the village of Ossining is is contemplating uh, similar legislation at this time that we had uh, sort of spoken with Corporation Council Kahan um, as we were, you know, coming up with this a couple of months ago. Um, and I know that they've had it on their agenda, I want to say twice in the last couple of weeks, and they had an out an outpouring of, of people. This is now, I think, the third time that we've had it on agenda recently, and we've not seen anybody. The leaf blower. Mm -hmm. What did their outpouring say? Well, I'm not objecting. In favor? Right. Um, from what I heard, it was pretty mixed. They had a lot of folks who, you know, as Councilman Wilcher was saying, you know, bring up economic arguments. And, you know, really the one that I heard more than once was the technology just isn't there for, you know, electric. And until such point as it is, you know, you can argue quality of life. But as far as, you know, being able to get the job done, it's, it's not feasible. But again, I think you know, we're not trying to take it away during leaf blowing season. We're, we're, we're just limiting times of day and we're limiting times of year. So it's not taking it completely away. And again, if we do that specifically with the gas powered um, so that people can still use their little rinky dink battery pack to get the clippings off of their walkway or whatever, then it seems like it's a compromise um, and we're still moving in the correct direction. So, yes, no, okay. So I can take a look at those other municipalities you mentioned, see if they have anything that may be um, instructive to your discussion. And um, if I find anything, I can try to get you comments in advance of the continuation of the public hearing next Tuesday. Thank you. Sounds good. Excuse me? Are you Christy? I don't know who. Oh, oh is, this my, is that my name? Yeah, your name's over here. We're not sure if it's the ghost of For everyone watching. <laughs> okay. Um, great. All right, so next, are we going to bounce back to the website um, proposal? Oh, sorry, did I, I, you know what? That's okay, I we're just bouncing, actually, we're just we're, bouncing. Look at the, I never saw the actual uh, session agenda, so it's going off my notes. 
Yes, let's go to the website. Okay, um, so I had sent um, the proposal that was prepared by a company called Revise um, to the town board. Um, this is at this point really just um, illustrative of something that we might like to do. Um, they are a company, one of many, who basically cold called us and said, hey, I've been checking out your website, it could use some work. Um, and this is one that we entertained. So uh, Ms. Caffarelli and I um, sat in on what was probably like a half an hour uh, demonstration um, of what this company had to offer. And, you know, I'll speak for myself and, you know, um, I thought it was pretty impressive. I mean, certainly impressive compared to what we have now, but keeping in mind what we have now is almost free. Um, you know, it's something that we're able to manage in house. It's a little quirky, um, but with the help of our webmaster, it's something that we're able to really hold the cost down on. Um, so as far as what I'm asking of the board at this time um, is, are you interested in entertaining proposals to update the website? And if so, to what degree? Um, because as you saw, the, um, the presentation that we got is, is pretty swanky. Um, and we were quoted, he basically said, tell me what you have to spend and we can back in to it. Um, but it sounded like the design would be between eight and nine thousand uh, dollars if we signed a five-year contract and then a thirty four hundred dollar a year uh, maintenance fee and at the beginning of the fifth year they would completely redo the format of the website to our specifications so right before the contract was about to end um, do you have any um, I think the only thing that I really liked was the way in which you edited this type of website. I've worked with WordPress websites where um, when I worked for the town of Newcastle and I found it a little difficult to use. And I thought the way that they, um, the, the type of management system that they use seemed very easy to use and better in my opinion. So I like that about their design and I guess and it also looked very nice. <laughs> Are they managing it or are we managing it? We're managing the content. Um, but as far as like troubleshooting, like for example, if you had, you know, oh, I can't figure out how to change the font on something. It's not doing what I need. They have a 24 hour US based customer service um, folks who can help you. Their office is based in, help me, I want to say Minnesota. Something like yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. Like um, and, you know, just, this is just, you know, we're, we're not ready to sign anything just sort of as an example, um, taking into account the amount of money that would be involved and then, you know, potentially the added cost of, I think for this one, it was $3 per document uh, that needed to be transferred over to a new website, um, which from talking to uh, folks in the village is a pretty competitive rate, actually. Um, so just kind of wanted to, you know, get the temperature of what the board was thinking, if this is something that you wanted to budget for for 2019. Um, we also spoke with uh, Dean, who is our current webmaster, um, about the fact that we might be pursuing something like this. And he said, well, boy, you know, I have some ideas um, that I could probably, you know, knock around for next to nothing, you know, if you guys are really interested in tuning this up. Um, so I guess what we're just looking for right now is sort of a sense of how much money, if any, um, the board would be willing to commit to this, or if you think it's necessary or if you're happy with how things are going. I think, you know, speaking for myself and I think speaking for Victoria, um, it's a little clunky. I mean, we're, yeah. we're the two, yeah, and, and a little bit Holly, um, but really it's the two of us who really, you know, mess around with the website. Um, and you really have to sort of trick it into what you want it to do most of the time. It's not very intuitive. And I also know from one resident's call, um, it's not, it's not very easy to navigate the way we have it set up. And maybe that's, you know, just the way that we have it, maybe that could be changed in the format that, that we currently have. Um, but, you know, especially looking at the village's new website, it's it's pretty sweet. I think we could do better. Yeah, I, I absolutely <laughs> think we could do better. I don't think that's a lot of money at all for a website, um, either for management or for the, re the redesign. Um, so I, you know, definitely would um, be interested in getting a couple of other proposals and yeah. seeing what that those would look like, and I think that we should absolutely consider it for um, for a budget for 2019. I'd like to see some other proposals. I definitely think our website needs some work, but I'm cheap, so yeah. um, I'd like to hear from our guy. I'd like to hear from that. I'd like to hear from maybe some of our local people who really understand Austinning and know kind of how Austinning flows. If they have a better idea of how. I mean, I looked at this proposal. It, it looks good. It looks like they've been doing this for quite a few years, and they, they have a handle on it. Um, so, I mean, you, you talk to them. You like them. 
So, so I mean, they just won a pretty prestigious award for a web. They they do municipal websites. I mean, by that's sort of yeah, that that's their deal. Um, and they just won an award for Huddo, Texas, is is the town. And so they had us go take a look at that. And Huddo has a lot going on. Uh, I see they did or, Mount Kisco too. Or at least they made it look like Huddo has an awful lot going on. And there were a few other just New York municipalities, yeah. Long Island. I mean, they're not they're not just Wisconsin. What I was wherever they're from. That is that we can reach out to Mount Kisco and it, yeah, exactly and the other one that's local and say you know how was the process was it what they proposed you know and just sort are you of happy are they getting out? your information right. now yeah. exactly and, and how is and how is the management going forward based on the service that you get from them as well as you know to to make updates or whatever okay I'd so, like to I'd like to explore that. Now, before we even do any redesigns, do we have any stats on how people actually use the sites? Like, what are people going to the website for? Because those are, I got feedback from my teenage kids. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> um, what, are, how we actually use, how are people actually using the sites? Because those are the things that should be more prominent. So, mm -hmm. do we have any stats on how many people use it, when they use it, what they're going there for, that kind of thing? I am quite sure that Dean does. Yeah, um, I, I'm fairly certain. I mean, just sort of, you know, from answering the phone in our office, what people are usually looking for local laws, uh, garbage schedule, things like that, which both are both things that you really have to sort of dig for. I mean, you have to say, go to publications and don't do the drop down, just hover and then click. And then you go uh -huh. like, I mean, it's sort of involved. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't have any luck with our website at all. I have to say it is non-intuitive. I would say. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so are we, you know, actually considering, uh, would you like us to work on the stats first, or would you like us to work on creating? I'd like a... to see this. I mean, I, I think it should be updated. That mm -hmm. would be my opinion, and I'd like to know at least what the stats are to know what we should be focusing on for updating. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you envision this as sort of like an RFP sort of process, or just solicit, you know, companies that like the village used, for example, some of our neighboring communities have used that we like? Do you I see it more as a formal? RFP, but I, I have a feeling I'm going to get into a heftier uh, number, although. We'd have to really know what we want before we could do an RFP, right? I mean, if you just say you want a website over overhaul, essentially. RFP sounds like it's getting more complicated than it needs to. Okay, we're on it. Okay. All right, thank you. So, um, I think I'm next, too. Are you next? Pavilions and <laughs> rental fees and noise. I head down. I had, I did do a little research um, to, to find what we had worked with last year um, when we were talking a little bit about um, some of these issues. And I found some a document that uh, Chris Soy had put together, which was the noise ordinance compliance reminder that we were supposed to uh, give out to people when they rented our facilities, which included no amplified music permitted, after 9 p.m. on any day, except as specifically authorized in a permit issued by the town of Austin. Moreover, the playing of such music and the use of such loudspeakers should comply in all respects with Chapter 130 noise of the Austin Town Code, which said that permissible decibel level of any music being played between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. is 60 decibels, 60 dBs, um, which can easily be exceeded when music is amplified through a variety of devices, blah, 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 blah. And then there were some uh, tables that sort of gave you a sense of what 60 dBs actually is equivalent to. It's like a telephone conversation or something from, from what I recall, right? It's not... Yeah, a power mower is 100, <laughs> just since we were talking about it. Um, Normal conversation at three to five feet is 60 to 70 decibels. Dial tone of a telephone is 80 decibels. Ordinary tones are three. Um, conversation three feet away, 60. So um, in any case, that was just some something interesting I, I wanted to throw out there. Um, because we had uh, we did have an event this weekend, and we did get some noise complaints about the um, event that was from 1.30 till 10 at night, which really ended at 10.30. Um, or no, I think the music stopped at 10, although we were originally promised that the music was going to stop earlier, like by 9.30, and then they would be cleaned up and out by 10, and that didn't exactly happen. Um, so we just wanted to talk about that 
policy wise because we receive complaints from the restaurant we receive complaints from uh, some residents in town as well as in at Harbor Square and that might be something that we actually have to consider how we aim speakers that we require speakers be aimed that we, requ we require there not be music after for example 9 30 or that any music after a certain hour be kept below a certain decibel level the restaurant complained yes they complained <laughs> the sincerely <laughs> well i have no no problem with that right now <laughs> um but I, I find that funny because um they're the loudest thing down there almost every night so the restaurant yeah they, they have a lot of loud music so that you can I, hear yeah in the, I, in the I just hear that, that and the, I know that some of the neighbors from the restaurant complain so I guess they outdid their music yeah so anyway so it was just worth bringing that up and then we were also talking about moving officially moving the or did we do that already did we move the the angle stage rental so I think the board sort of had consensus to have done that. Yeah. Um, but I think before we formally adopt the new um, application or, or permit, uh, as, as it were, um, there are still a few changes that needed to be made, which is why we added it back to the agenda tonight. Um, so just to recap, the board had decided that uh, they wanted to move the Engel Park stage and spectator area from the uh, park facility application that the town shares with the village of Ossining um, that has all of our sports fields and so on um, to the town's exclusive uh, pavilion and picnic uh, area rental application. So we did that. We talked to the village. They said, yeah, no problem. Just let us know. Um, so now here we are. And the things that are still outstanding are as follows. Um, the first one has to do with cost. So um, as the supervisor had mentioned, we sort of went back and forth uh, with Chris Soy about this. And I think we were doing some comparisons to county pavilion facilities as well as some of our neighboring communities. Um, and I know uh, Councilman Shaw, you had asked um, Bill when he was with us at the library um, to sort of take a look. Um, so we're gonna try to get that information from him. Um, but the sort of more important point is that we've been hearing some grumblings that the price was no good for only four hours, that people used to get the whole day for less than that. Um, so the board had, again, informally uh, said that they were okay with the 250 being a day rate. So 225, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, the 225 being a day rate. So basically, thank you. Whenever the park is open from dawn to dusk, it's yours for the day because we weren't really seeing people double up on the rentals, which was the reason for having the, the hourly to begin with. So now the question becomes, is 225 a good rate for the entire day? And then the second question becomes, um, we've been getting a lot of questions for people seeking discounts. Um, I am a nonprofit organization. I'm a Girl Scout troop. I'm a Boy Scout troop. I always used to get a discount. What, you know, what is this new policy? And, you know, we've been standing pretty firm and saying no discounts because everybody has a valid reason, certainly. You know, we have a lot of great organizations in our community that, you know, do a lot of work, you know, for the town, for the village, for our residents for free. And, you know, sure, they should get a discount. Um, but we don't really have a provision for that. So the second question was, does the board think that we should add a nonprofit or community organization tier to the pricing in the same way that we have one for the um, facilities, as in the, the sports fields Just as a application. Reminder, we did used to have that and we got rid of it because Chris, I believe, was the one who said it was very cumbersome. And there was also resident and non-resident designation, um, which still exists, by the way, on the other form. Just uh, for a quick refresher, um, we did get some information that Chris had collected in 2017 for group picnic and pavilion use fees. Westchester County for their pavilion was charging 300 to $450. Um, it doesn't say for how long, but I'm guessing that's for the day, depending on which pavilion and which in their picnic areas were 175 to 200. Mount Pleasant group picnic and shelter 225 flat fee, Briarcliff Pavilion 250 with a $50 additional hour. So that was for four hours, plus a $75 supervisor fee. Um, Newcastle 250 
for four hours for a picnic shelter and $50 for each additional. And a gazebo is $150 plus $50 additional. And those are all residents, by the way. The, the, the non-resident fee was higher. Well, I shouldn't say that. In Newcastle, they have an, a resident and non-resident. Porchester group park use under $50, $100, 50 to 100 225 and over $100, $600. And non-resident was uh, considerably higher. Um, and then Peekskill group use park under 19, $50, 20 to 40 people, a hundred dollars. doesn't look like there's, and that's for residents and non-residents, $130 under 19 people and 250 for 20 to 40. One of the issues that Chris has brought up and I think we know to be true is when you start to regulate by the number of people using it, you know, everybody's going to put down that they're under 50. Or whatever, whatever your cutoff is, and whoever shows up, you know, who's going to now go back and say, "Hey, you owe us another whatever amount of money," um, or you, you gotta, you know, stop having your thing. It's, it's not likely that that's going to happen. So, I think that's why he was more in favor of just coming up with these flat fees. The idea of all these nonprofit groups, on the flip side, of having the discount is that. Um, you know, while they do things for the community, they're also taking up the space of, at the pavilion that somebody else who might be paying more would rent it for. Um, are the taxpayer dollars supposed to be offsetting the these various and sundry not-for-profits? Again, many of them do good work. Do we then have to go through and decide which ones get the discount? Or do we just have this blanket approach? And if so, what is it? I will tell you that I think it was the Girl Scouts that said to me, look, even if you gave us $50 or, you know, off, at least we would know that there was like a good faith effort being made to, you know, not for profits that do to give back so much to the community. This is usually, this form goes to us or it goes to the rec center? Re the rec center administers this. Okay, so then they would have to determine who should get money off. I mean, that just well, makes have it really to difficult. Give, they'd have to give a not some kind of a not-for-profit I think Given. there would have to be some sort of predetermined designation by this board as to not a nonprofit I mean to the best you can but um, you know for to the extent that a situation may happen with like the supervisor just mentioned with someone just saying hey you know give, show give us something I don't think that if the board had set a flat fee the rec center would have the discretion to then go back of its own accord and make that sort of adjustment without this board's approval. I was thinking about this when um, I was looking. I think a lot of our um, groups, like the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, sports teams, whatever, I'd be more willing to give them a break, um, a significant, more significant break if they were doing weekday events. You know, I think the weekends is when residents want to use it for their parties and their families. And I think they're really more available on the weekdays so that if the scouts or, you know, any of the other groups wanted to have a team gathering or whatever, I think if they could commit to doing it on a weekday, then it could be a significantly less, lower price in my mind. That was something I was thinking about. Okay, so just a couple of things that are coming up. You know, the Columbus Lodge is on our, uh, tonight, um, they haven't asked us for any any sort of break but I mean theoretically they're as far as I know they're not for profit um, the um, PBA is hosting an event Thank you. again fire department hosts events I mean a lot of these are right. you know not for profits and or they're part of our community who's which and they're having a weekend event which of these gets what deal or waived outright. Completely waived. Like PBA and fire department, I think they anticipate they aren't paying for anything. Which is traditional. Which is traditional. Mm -hmm. But so is traditional to not, you know, to charge the Boy Scouts to the Girl Scouts. Or any other yeah, but we all, we all have to get on the same page because we're, we're sort of so all over smashing there. heads a little bit because we have a new recreation superintendent. The desk has been doing it this way. Now the board wants to do it a different way. So we kind of need to get one set of rules that everybody can live with. I mean, I would be in favor of giving, you know, a discount for not-for-profits. And then I think police and fire just get waived. Just get what they want. They get waived. 
just police and fire. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, whatever our, our first responders that are yeah, first part responders. of our that are basically part of our town. And another um, consideration that um, our office has been asked to make several times is for folks who are employees of the town and the village, who traditionally have. I don't think we should give that. I think that that's again a very slippery slope. Um, but um, I agree with you. Agree. Agree. Okay. Okay. So so maybe do a seventy five dollar discount, fifty or seventy five dollar discount for not for profits. Okay. So two questions: Is this to be enacted for this summer, or are we talking about next summer? Is this effective immediately? Because we have folks who have already rented parks, already put down deposits. Yeah. I think that we would have to. Um, for next season. Okay. So then we do have a little bit of time to do a little bit more research about the actual base price. Even if the board agrees to a $75 discount, is everyone happy at the $225 for the day? Or do you want to explore that a little bit more? I'd like to explore that. Okay. Because from what Dana was reading off, the right. price seem a little low if it's for the day. Okay. Yeah. Um, and do we want to look at just the um, pavilion and picnic? Do we want to look at the pavilions only? Do we want to look at the picnic areas? Do we want to look at the stage? I mean, are there any of these that we're comfortable where they are, or we want to explore all three? We'd like to explore all three. Okay. Um, the next thing has to do with the deposit. Um, so now that we are no longer considering how many people are going to be at an event, um, someone who's having a 15 person baby shower as compared with somebody who's having a 150 person softball game is putting down the same 75 dollar deposit um our conversation that we had again when mr garrison was with us at the library was giving um his office some sort of discretion about the amount of the deposit um so for example if you know i mean if you just know based on the way that the event is going to be described that it's going to be bigger than that then the deposit would be something like 150. is that something that the board is comfortable with leaving him that discretion yes. okay um if i could just chime in on that that's not consistent with the way the code is written right now so you would have to do a local law amending the code the code currently says the rec department can assess a cleanup deposit equal to the amount of the actual fee. So whatever you're charging them is up to the amount that the deposit could be. So if you want to charge them more than what they're currently going to be paying. So we're talking about. So we'll give him discretion up to the up, or whatever. up to the amount of the rent. Yeah, that's fine. Well, I guess in the instance right now that somebody was going to rent a picnic area and that's $75 and it was going to be 200 people for some reason, not, not that that would ever happen. Um, you're saying that that I mean, would not yeah, be that permitted. Be, that <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's just but that's a hypothetical scenario that where, there, based upon what the code says, there could be a situation in the future where you're you're not actually allowed to do that, based upon the way the code currently is drafted. Okay. Well, let's let's leave it for now because I don't think we're going to go up to ex or exceed that two hundred and twenty-five dollars for a deposit. I, I can't imagine that we would exceed that. Well, if we're looking at all of the other areas as well where the fees are lower but they're smaller area i mean they're not they nobody would for the picnic areas i don't think people would have 100 people in those little picnic areas okay but they, would, uh, they, they have they do. just saying okay and do you believe that they've gone and gotten a permit and said that they are having 100 people no so, so we're but, not going to be a, but now we're not going by people anymore Well, that well, if we're not going by people, but they know that it's going to be a bigger group, that's that's what we're just giving the discretion to is if it's a bigger group. I guess what I mean is the description of the event. So if you say I'm having a, a go kart race is different from saying I'm having a baby shower. You don't have to not ask how many people are coming, by the way. We just aren't charging by the number of people. The only thing we were talking about charging by the number of people for is the um, deposit. So somebody may put down whatever. Like, for example, this event that happened over the weekend, I think the original application said somewhere between 50 and 75 people, but then in the conversations with the applicant, it turned out that they were they were saying it was going to be three to 400 people. And it sounded like it was no rep music. I could tell so, you the guy would do it. They I said they had more than, way more than and three other people. The guy on stage, he was, oh, he was more, I don't know. 
over the course of the day, it might have been more. In any case. Okay. Um, I have a question. Applications may be submitted no later than 15 days prior to the requested date. I get why, but what if it's open and somebody says, hey, is there something open? Does that mean they can't rent it if they didn't figure you want it out to change two it to seven advance? days? I believe that's also the way the code is drafted, so that would okay. require a local law amendment. I think I'm, and also, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't know off the top of my head, but I remember from when Chris was going through all this, he said that there's something in the parks chapter of the town code that makes reference to noise in the parks. So this making reference to the noise code of the town code or the noise chapter of the town code isn't exactly correct because there's something in the park section of the town code that refers to noise separately. So I think, I, I'm not saying that that's true or false, but I just, it seems like there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this particular section of the town code. So I don't think we should be scared away from doing it just because it's a pain. I, I think agree. there's it's a couple pieces that- It's just something to keep in mind. It's not as simple as just a resolution. Fee schedule or, yeah. It's something that you may want to consider more globally. And maybe the next conversation is actually, I, I printed it out in advance this conversation, but maybe the entire board taking a look at, it's only four pages, what the parks chapter currently says and seeing if and in what ways that would need to be amended to be consistent with what your goals are going forward. I think that's a great idea. Hopefully we see that. And I think it would also I, I think it's necessary to have to have Bill Garrison a part of these conversations. You know, I, I'd like him to be at the next work session that we discuss this because um, you know, I think his feedback is required. At, at the very least, you know, we should get him involved um, else. Okay. So if we're not talking about changing it for this season, then we can stop. Okay. All right. So again, any other comments? Um, well, and the rec advisory board, if you guys want to weigh in about it, if there's any reason that they have opinions about this, that would be fine as well. Okay. So let's we'll send it up to them. Next up, we have our special meeting. Do you need to do roll call? Uh, you need to do a motion to leave. Motion the work to session. okay. So we didn't even we didn't do roll call. So do I even do a motion? You have to do it after the motion because you're not in a meeting yet. Right now you're in a work session, so you would do a motion to go into your meeting. Okay. And then once you're in the meeting, then you would do the roll. Okay. So can I have a motion to go into our special meeting? Moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Wonderful. So we are now in our special meeting. Okay. Did she have an agenda? Yep. Chuck off. Oh, I got it. I got it. Okay. Um, council member Dettori. Uh, council member Shaw. Present. Council member Feldman. Present. Council member Wilcher. Mm -hmm. And Supervisor Levenberg. Okay. Uh, have announcements, I think? Yep, announcements. All right. So tonight was supposed to be the first night of the annual St. Augustine's Church Italian Festival, but as you might imagine, the weather was not on their side. The plan is to be on as scheduled tomorrow. Wednesday, it's supposed to be beautiful through Sunday night. Uh, I think it's the 21st of Sunday night. 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. for rides, second. entertainment, dancing, games of chance, delicious food, and the white elephant sale. If you've never visited this event, you are in for a treat. Admission and parking are free, and tomorrow night, they will set off their annual fireworks display. If you didn't get enough of the town's Independence Day celebration two weeks back, come on down to St. Augustine's tomorrow night and make an evening of it. If the fireworks get rained out tomorrow, which I'm sure they're not going to, uh, Thursday 719 is their rain date. Also tomorrow, Wednesday the 18th, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef will be holding her annual senior forum at Cortland Town Hall at 1 Heady or Heady Street. I've never known how to pronounce that. Join in, in Cortland. Join Sandy starting at 9 a.m. for a free breakfast before you learn about topics important to today's seniors, including heart health, avoiding scams targeting seniors, driving at night, and eye health, and more. The event will last until 12 noon, so come learn from some local experts about how to keep the seniors in your life safe, healthy, and happy. The next installment of the Briarcliff Manor Chamber of Commerce's concert series is on for this Thursday evening at Law Park in Briarcliff Manor. Come enjoy some snacks and drinks while listening to the live music stylings of Off the Record, 
between 7 and 9 p.m. To learn more about this free event, visit briarcliffchamber.org. That very same evening, the Austin Documentary and Discussion Series will be hosting a screening of Don't Tell Anyone in the Budars Theater at the Austin Public Library. This documentary is a difficult one. It explores the plight of our nation's undocumented population and the social, economic, and health consequences they face due to the silence they must endure. This free screening begins at 6.30 p.m. and will be followed by a panel of experts, including one young woman whose story is chronicled in the film. Don't miss this important and timely event on Thursday. Also beginning on Thursday night, Westchester Collaborative Theater will be presenting a staged reading of Feedback Loop, which explores the lives of six teenagers coming into their own, set against the early 90s rock scene in suburban USA. Please note this production contains material suited for adult viewers only, including very strong language and content. Please be mindful of who you invite along. Showtimes and tickets are available by visiting WCT or WCTheater.org. On Friday night, 720, I hope to see a big crowd at the waterfront for a performance by a band that started in Austin, Jigsaw, as part of the 2018 Summer Concert Series. The fun starts at 7 p.m., so be sure to bring some chairs or a blanket and get comfortable for a night of live music along the Hudson. We will also be joined by Gyro Uno Food Truck. We may have another special appearance of the homespun merry-go-round to be determined, which has been a big hit, as well as a special guest food truck to be announced. So plan to enjoy dinner and an incredible sunset among friends. On Saturday, we have two great free workouts on offer as part of Mind, Body, Spirit, Austin program. On Saturday, the 21st, join Megan, who will be filling in for Alicia Simpson of the Crossover Yoga Project for Rise and Shine Yogurt, yoga, not yogurt, at 8.30 a.m. You can have the yogurt afterwards. It's a good thing after yoga at Angle Park. Later that afternoon, Sue Radpavar of Studio 95 Zumba will also be at the Angle Park stage for an energetic Zumba class at 3 p.m. Come get your sweat on with some of our local experts while you enjoy our beautiful Hudson River scenery. In between, why not head over to the Dale Cemetery Gravestone Cleaning with Austin Historic Cemeteries Conservancy. At 9 a.m., meet the group and they will take care of the rest. No experience required. Make sure you wear clothes that you won't mind getting a little dirty or damp. On the morning of Sunday, July 22nd at 11 a.m., the Village of Briarcliff Manor will be hosting a ribbon cutting for the grand reopening of the Route 9A North State Road intersection. This project has been discussed for many years and we are so glad it is finally complete. Extra special thanks to the Village of Briarcliff and Village Manager Phil Zagarelli for taking the lead on this complicated project and helping it to fruition. Assemblywoman Sandy Galef and Senator David Carlucci are also to be thanked for their uh, support financial and as well as uh, making sure that the state DOT uh, was on board with this and navigating the state DOT, which is always uh, tricky, as well as county legislator Catherine Borgia for all the work at the county level necessary to get this improvement accomplished, which we hope will help ease traffic on this major corridor. I'm sure many of you have already experienced the new lining and traffic lights. I look forward to celebrating with our board as well as the prior town board who brought the town in on the work and the Board of Trustees for Briarcliff. We're already getting great feedback on the smoother traffic flow as a result of this project. On Saturday, July 28th, Westchester County Department of Health will be sponsoring a free rabies clinic for dogs, cats, and ferrets at the SPCA on North State Road between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Appointments are required for your furry friend. Please call 941-2896, extension 10, to plan a visit. Westchester residents only, please. Cats and ferrets must be in carriers, dogs must be leashed, and aggressive dogs must be muzzled. All pets, regardless of temperament, must be supervised by a human adult. That evening, WCT will host Jerry Malkin Collective with Ingrid Jensen as part of their Jazz Master Series. Again, that's July 28th. Ingrid Jensen recently worked with some musicians from Austin High School at Bethany Arts Community and she was phenomenal, so take advantage of this opportunity to hear some first-class musicians right in our backyard. Doors open at 7 p.m. for the 8 p.m. performance. Admissions $20 per person. 
Visit wctheater.org for more info and to get your tickets. Finally, there are two great events taking place later this month to support the Croton and Austin Community Tennis Association. The Summer Sizzler is a two-part fundraiser, all taking place on Saturday, July 28th. Part one is a social tennis mixer at the Shannon Ross Tennis Courts at Nelson Park between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. If you want to get in on a little friendly competition, all you need to do is register and they will work out the schedule and teams for you. Part two is a party at the home of Patrice and Jeff Davidson in Croton between 7 and 9.30 p.m., including Jeff's world-class barbecue. To participate, reserve your spot for one or both events by visiting crotontennis.org. And don't forget, we still have a collection box for the Austin uh, OCAA. Anybody? Anybody? Uh, Cultural Arts Association. Austin Cultural Arts Association, which is the cultural arts group that helps support all of the cultural arts at Austin High School and the and also the PTA. And um, these shoes are being collected to exchange for scholarship money, which will go um, be will go through the cultural arts advocates as well as the PTA uh, and disperse to students at Austin High School. So, am I not saying the right thing, Maddie? You... Okay, so we still have a collection box here outside the clerk's office on the first floor, 16 Croton Avenue. Please bring your gently used shoes, Crocs, sandals, flip-flops, hiking shoes, boots, whatever you got, uh, and drop them off in one of the boxes here in the front of 16 Croton Avenue. Inside. They, they can... Gently used. What are they doing? There's an organization that collects them, and I think, I don't know if they send them uh, to Thailand? other, I think they might send them to other countries, yeah. Oh. They send them to Thailand, oh. and for that, there is They will money. give us money for our program. Exactly. So it's a pay it forward, reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. You like it? Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah, it's fun. And that's it for my announcements. Have I missed anything significant that anybody would like to add? Just Fire parade. Oh. Well, that's in August, so I just okay. thought I had a little time. But yes, the fire parade. Mm -hmm. We we did get invited to the fire parade, which is August third, Friday, August third, which is why our concert series that week will be on August second. Um, so that's the following week, and we, I, I don't know, are all of us planning to attend the parade? One, no, yeah. two. We believe that most of us are, are going to be attending that parade. And we look forward to seeing the community out there that day. It's a great event. And uh, it's a great community event. We hope you'll join, join us and enjoy. So we're... I will most likely join you at Sea Town. At Sea Town? Okay. Some, somewhere in that area. Okay. I mean, because if you don't feel like marching, then you can also just wait at the, um, the, the, the station at um, Main Street. You know, that's the other... The viewing, the viewing stand on Main Street. All right, so moving into our meeting agenda. Yes, into resolutions. the resolutions. Okay, so the first is permission to hold a special event at Cedar Lane Park Pavilion, Sunday, August 5th, 2018. Um, whereas the Town Board of the Town of Austinay has a permit in place for the rental facilities in town parks, and whereas for most events, the Superintendent of Recreation has the discretion to approve or reject an application, but larger events may be sent to the Town Board for formal approval. And whereas an application was filed in June 2018 for use of the Cedar Lane Park Pavilion for Saturday, August 5th, 2018 by Columbus Lodge number 692 for the annual Columbus Lodge family picnic to take place between 12 p.m. and 6 p.m. And this application was referred to the town board. Resolved that the town board of the town of Austining hereby authorizes the superintendent of recreation to accept this application and ensuring that the proper insurance and applications are in place with the Department of Recreation. Do I have a motion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, next is permission to hold special event at Lewis Engel Park Stage and Spectator Area, Saturday, August 25th, 2018. 
um, whereas the Town Board of the Town of Ossining has a permit in place for the rental of facilities in town parks, and whereas for most events, the Superintendent of Recreation has a discretion to approve or reject an application, but larger events may be sent to the Town Board for formal approval, and whereas an application was filed in June 2018 for use of the Angle Park stage and spectator area for Saturday, August 25th, 2018, rain date August 26th, by Columbus Lodge number 692 for the Italian Heritage Day Festival to take place between 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. and this application was referred to the Town Board. Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Ossining hereby authorizes the Superintendent of Recreation to accept this application and ensuring that the proper insurance and applications are in place with the Department of Recreation. Do I have a motion? I'll move. So, quick discussion about this. Um, this is going until 10 p.m., and we just received some complaints. I'm just wondering if we want to put some sort of stipulation in uh, regarding the use of amplified sound to only go until 9 p.m. Um, this one's been held at Vets for a long time in a neighborhood, and I don't know that they've had a lot of complaints. Um, but we can ask the police department to. And, and I don't know that I think we need to. But it's definitely group, an idea. Each group is, is different. Now, I know you can say no music after nine or whatever, but, but it's, it, it, it depends on the people. It's not necessarily everybody likes. Rap and well, maybe we could put a volume control. No, we could do both. Absolutely, we can do volume control. Yeah, like, right. like you know, get the sound meter down there. Right, if they're above. Then I mean, we have a noise ordinance that right. we can enforce. And we and just I think we should enforce a noise ordinance this, and maybe not. Is this the uh, law? The, 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 you know, Peter used to be on the board here. Chipotle. Chipotle is the is he a member of this? I can't answer that. You know. Oh, okay. But they, they've rent, they've rented parks and even wasn't it in uh, Main Street last year, the Columbus Day yeah. Festival, yeah. and it was in the middle yeah. of Main Street last year. I don't think it was a okay. problem. Okay, so we're just gonna leave as is. And, but start really looking at our noise order. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next, contract for lock, lock box services, Starling National Bank. Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Ossining hereby authorizes the receiver of taxes to enter into a contract with Sterling National Bank for the provision of remote tax collection services for the Town of Ossining Tax Office, subject to approval by Council as to form. Do we have a motion? Um, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, contract retainer service retainer agreement for legal services. Resolve that the town board of the town of Ossining hereby authorizes the supervisor to sign a retainer agreement on behalf of the town of Ossining with Danielle G. Vincelletti, PC of Albany, New York, for legal support on tax certiorari cases related to the Sleepy Hollow Country Club, index numbers 66855, 2012, 65431, 2013, and 66118, 2014, with compensation in accordance with the proposal submitted to the Briarcliff Manor School District Attorney dated June 27, 2018. Do I have a motion? Um, friendly amendment, it should be Daniel. Um, I was thinking of Rob, our auditor, I oh, guess, okay. when I typed that. Daniel. Yeah. Daniel. Yes, yes, yes. So we received a trial date for the Sleepy Hollow Country Club tax, which is, I believe, December 10th. Um, this is also tied to the reasons for the other uh, golf course that we that is in our uh, town. And we had decided we would be willing to fight versus settle. And the same is true now that we are getting to trial time. We do have help and support from the Briarcliff School District, which uh, stands to lose the most. Um, we have also reached out again to the village of Briarcliff, who did agree to some uh, support early on. We're hopeful they will see the benefit of pursuing this rather than uh, backing down and settling. Um, meanwhile, we do need to ha have higher trial counsel. Up until now, we've managed to keep our costs low by using um, in-house counsel for the various municipal and school entities. Uh, but now that we're going to trial, we need to hire trial counsel. So without any questions or other further discussion, 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Might I have an adjournment into executive uh, session for advice of council and personnel and or no? Personnel and contracts. And contracts. Advice of council, personnel, and contracts. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We hope you have a wonderful week. There's lots to do here in the town of, and of Austin and the villages of Austin and Briarcliff. We hope you'll take full advantage. We will see you next week at the courthouse on Tuesday, July 24th for our regular legislative session. Bye-bye.